evening and welcome to LL Supumar Takes. This is our 166 take. Live from the Alec Bradley Lone Star Studios of Euless, Texas. I'm your host, Barry Duplissy, as always. And I'm so proud, so pleased, and so privileged to be with you all tonight. This is going to be a fantastic show. I've been waiting a long time to ask this guest to join, to offer him an invitation. But I have a hunch that if I never had offered it to him, he would have said, fuck you, I'm stealing one anyway. But I'm so excited to have him on. We're going to get to formal introductions here in a little bit. And that's a little bit of a joke, guys. Don't worry. It may get a little squirrely tonight, but trust me, not at each other. Well, maybe. Who knows? We do have to thank the people that make this show possible. And that, of course, is our sponsors. Tonight's show is sponsored by Drew Estate. Drew Estate and the Cigar Dojo team up once again to release the 2021 limited edition Underground Dojo Dogma Sungrown Underground Dojo Dogma Duro. The bear of box press Underground Dojo Dogma cigars will be available exclusively for Drew Diplomat program participants and will be showcased on Freestyle Live Special Edition on Drew Estate's Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash Drew Estate Cigar on Thursday, May 6th, so a couple days away from now, 7 p.m. Eastern. Stay tuned, tune in, and check out your Drew Diplomat retail, retailers for Underground Dojo Dogma Sungrown and Underground Dojo Dogma Maduro. I love alliteration, but that was still confusing, but I hope everyone got the picture on that. Oveja Negra Brands is our next sponsor. Four unique companies who share a passion to provide innovative cigars for the next generation for cigar enthusiasts. Black Label, co- Black Label Training Company, Black Works Studio Dissident, and Emilio are combining premium tobaccos with an artisanal touch. Oveja Negra, where art and tobacco collide. Join the flock and visit ovejanegracigars.com to learn more. And welcome, everybody. Without further ado, after an intro like that, I have to welcome our guest of honor tonight, sponsored by United Cigars. Smoke one tonight and start living United, Mr. Lee Marsh. What's going on, man? Lee, how are you doing? I'm great, man. You fired me up with that intro. That was good. (laughs) You know, we had to redo it, man. That's awesome. The the people who are listening later on the podcast won't get the full, you know, just unbelievableness that that really was. I mean, you just, you went went full old school wrestling promo there. I loved it. (laughs) I was fired up. Fantastic, man. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that you are to join us. So I we're going to get into we're going to go into the intro here in a little bit because there is obviously a backstory there. But I, I, I kind of tease you with it. I told you I, I didn't tell you before that we started the show. I mean, how would I do? Did you like it? You did. You did great. Cool. You did great. And cool. for those that know me, I would have 100 percent just showed up, you know, and stole one. So it's all uh, <laughs> an appearance. Crash the Zoom, you know. <laughs> eager, eager, eager to hear all the story about that here in just a little bit, but uh, definitely uh, want to kind of get into a couple of things here. First of all, what 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 are you smoking tonight? Tonight I am starting off with the Crook of the Crown Robusto, uh, our you know our inaugural blend. Uh, it's my baby, and then I have the on deck. I have the uh, Call to Arms Corona, ready to go. Awesome. Beautiful. I want, I wanted to talk about this cigar for a minute. So, so I actually, I too am sm- uh, smoking the, the crook of the crown. Uh, you, uh, you were kind enough to get me some, um, and I really, really appreciate this, but this is the, this is the, is this the Toro? This is the, you yeah. sent me a Toro and a Robusto, correct? Yeah. I sent you the whole portfolio. So you should yeah. have a Toro Robusto and then you should have a call to arms Robusto and Corona. Yes. Perfect. So, First of all, this is a just is just a gorgeous, you know, rustic wrappers to me have like this kind of there's kind of this uh, mentality like that they, they can't be beautiful because they're rustic, they're rough looking. And that's just yeah. not true. I think that their rustic cigars have this kind of they're they're they don't they're not elegant, but they're beautiful in their own right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, both, you know, both of our offerings are traditionally what you would call an ugly wrapper, right? Yeah, San Andreas Maduros, uh, as well as, you know, Sumatra's on the call. But the, I agree 100 percent, man. They have their own qualities that you really like, the oiliness and, you, you know, the, you, you see the character in the wrapper. Absolutely. And I want to talk about this. This is this was something that caught my eye as soon as I pulled this out. Um, so we're going to get to the label and the imagery here in a little bit. But I want to everyone see if I want to see if anyone can focus on this. I want to pull up my my camera a little bit closer here. Let's see if someone can see the oh yeah, you can see the foot. So, uh, if for those many people might be familiar with the term, you know, closed foot, shaggy foot. Um, you used it in the green room. You were talking about unfinished foot, which is th- this. That's how you would define this. But I, I have to say, Lee, this is something really unique. It almost looks like someone took a one of those giant punches 
you know yeah. how you would punch okay. a cigar and put it i mean it is really well executed um and i've just i've never if i can i can't remember it just looking that uniform before and i, I really i really dig the look uh Talk to us about that. Uh, I mean, we we went the flavor of the wrapper. I know that, but what right. was the kind of went into the decision there? So, uh, you know, Jr. and I both love the idea of the unfit of uh, the closed foot or unfinished foot with a crook because you know we spend a, a lot of time with wrapper selection um, when when you're developing blends and you're selecting tobaccos and and with with the Maduros, especially the San Andreas Maduros, the extensive you know differences that you have to go through for humidity and the aging process. To do a closed foot, it kind of elongates the process. There's a, there's a higher margin for error if you close that foot and it's not ready. And so when you do the unfinished foot, you kind you get the best of both worlds, right? So you get the optimal aging process and 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 you know processing of the cigar itself, and you still get that flavor bomb of that that initial hit of the wrapper when you when you toast the foot. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to I'm about to light this up, and I'm I'm really I'm really excited. Um... I, I was on the surface, uh, Lee. I was really excited to when I when I when I smoked it for the first time. Um, well, too excited, too excited to smoke this for the first time. So I've actually never I've actually never had this blend. Um, awesome. So I am I'm really excited. I hope that doesn't make you too nervous. But nah, um, man. I was really I was really excited to have you on the show because I, I as you know and 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 we were talking about this before the show and as my audience knows I'm really interested in the the story behind the story of people and everything and that's one of the things that kind of fascinated me about your story I've learned a little bit about you um, we've become you know Facebook friends in the last year because you know it's COVID and we have nothing to that's do right. to talk about cigars so that's right. uh, that's right. um, and 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 things like that but I I was really I was really excited to to be able to have the opp this opportunity and I think it's um, one of the things that I, I uh, really liked about the blend was just some of the tobaccos that you used. Uh, and I know this was a project that you worked on for a very long time. Um, so just kind of, um, I don't do a lot of wrapper binder filler talk on the show, but let's, let's take people through the blend and, and talk about how long it actually did take you as I, as I, I'm stalling, cause I want to light this up that how long it did actually take you and JR and uh, Noel to kind of put this project together. So the, the, the wrapper is obviously San Andreas Maduro. Uh, we use an Indonesian binder and then all Nicaraguan fillers. Um, so there's probably about four or five different regions in there, including Samoto, which is one of our, our you know, our, our little baby projects that, that kind of doesn't get enough uh, appeal. You know, a lot of people don't know a whole lot about it. It's a new, a relatively newer region of tobacco um, in Nicaragua. Um, but in terms of like the, the blend itself, we spend a lot more time actually selecting just tobaccos in general from a very baseline, from individual selections of what we wanted to use. The blend itself actually, believe it or not, for the crook, it came together super quick. Now we smoked it for probably a year and a half to two years before it came to market. Um, we, you know, you talk about that cigar nerd, tobacco nerd portion of it is, I get really infatuated with the process. So generally we, we did the same thing with the call. We've done, we do the same thing with the Habano that's coming out this summer. Um, generally I smoke a blend for about a year and a half before I release it to the public. Um, and it's just about, you know, learning the transitions and understanding what the tobacco is doing, how it's marrying. So we know it before you do, so we can, you know, better explain it and know what you're going to get, you know, and make sure that it meets the quality standards that we we've set for ourselves for sure. Um, so the, the sampling process took forever. I mean, we probably spent three or four days nonstop just sampling tobacco. It was just me, JR, and Noel. That's all we did was just sample tobacco nonstop. But when we when, when we finally sat down to start, you know, having an idea of what we wanted to do and work with, um, it was probably about three or four hours that we, we put the crook together. Um, and this was, it feels like ages ago now. I mean, because, you know, ourselves and Noel's grown so much over the last two and a half years um, that we were just sitting there in his garage, just putting stuff together, playing with the, the whole, the, uh, the whole gambit, if you will. Um, and it was, it was ironic of how quickly it came together because every blend after that has been the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned Samota tobacco, which I, I have, I have heard of vaguely, but 
is that something that Noel um, has kind of proprietary uh, proprietarily uh, procured? Have you heard of anyone kind else of. using it's, it, or was it something that you found? So it it's actually I don't know that you would call it proprietary, but it, it's one of those things where uh, the owner of Florida San Luis, where you know our our brand started in in terms of the manufacturing process, um, Carlos Pareda, like he he invested you know, pretty much his life savings cultivating the Samoto region. region. And uh, it, it's, I honestly, I had never heard of it before we started working with Noel and, and started, you know, until we went there and saw it and started sampling it. I had never heard of it before, myself included. And you're talking, I had spent probably three or four years before that traveling around, seeing different tobaccos, and it was super new to me. Um, it has been used before, but, um, you know, we're extensively using it, Noel and, and, and Stolen Throne, the Rojas brand and, and us. So it, uh, in, in terms of the longevity of the other varietals, it's, it's relatively new for a region, um, but it did exist before, you know, Noel and I. Okay. That's, that's, you know, cause it, again, it is unique. And uh, so let's dive in just a little bit more nerdiness here for a second for those, for those people who, who really like Nicaraguan tobacco, you know, Esteli t- tends to be, right? This, these are the generalities, right? Esteli sure. tends to be that spicy. Condenga tends to be that earthy. Yalapa tends to be that sweetness. Yep. Um, a lot more to it than that, but this, like I said, generalizations. Samota uh, and Omatempe is really like pepper bomb, like can be yep. overpowering if, if, if not used, uh, uh, if not used, if not used well, let's just put it that way. Um, but Samota, um, you know, for 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 the, the few that I've had, it has this it has this combo, this sweet savory to me, uh, kind of like there's there's kind of like an espresso coffee Bingo. thing going on. Bingo, it does. It's it's a super rich tobacco, um, and even for someone like myself, like we we don't use seco, right? We use viso and lajeros in, in all our blends. Um, but even the seco is so rich, and, and it's it does it has that a killer espresso flavor that, that that I love about it that you'll see in the crook and the, and the varietals just do a bunch of different stuff you know the call is you know Samoto Habana tobacco and it's 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 rich it's spicy it's savory it's it's kind of like almost like a hybrid of multiple regions depending on the varietal but the the, the most prominent flavor profile that you'll get from the crook with using it is, is that espresso flavor awesome well, there's there's a reason why I wanted to nerd out with you for a little bit on your tobacco blend here, because um, my first question has to do with something that blows my mind. And I mean, and, and please don't mis- mistake this. I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I know that your first cigar was with your uncle. Yeah. But you don't know what that cigar was. You don't remember. You don't recall. I don't. I don't. How did someone get this far in the process, the nerd that you've become? <laughs> and because I know you were a nerd before well, you got into cigars. So I know you, 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 you were yeah, just, I mean, what, so what, do you not in remember? My, in, in my defense, that was like, uh, like 17 years ago, right? Okay. So in my defense, I was like 15. So uh, I want to, I do want to say that it was a fresh roll because he was in the military and he traveled a lot, including the Cuba. Um, so I do want to say that it was a fresh roll because that's generally what he smoked. You know, he, he smoked some other stuff, but uh, he loved getting the farm rolls when he would go down there. Um, so I want to say it was that, but I, I mean, I'd be lying if I put any kind of certainty to it. So I do understand how here I am today, but I was 15. What the hell do you know? You know? Fair, fair, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Um, no, I was just like, I would have gone back and said, Hey, you know, uncle, what, 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 what Hey, what was what that? He, don't, yeah, he what doesn't was remember that? either. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I think, uh, I might, when you started talking that intro for a second, I thought, Oh man, maybe you were drunk and, or maybe it was like a really shitty day. Like your girlfriend had just broken up with you and I'm bringing up these bad memories or something. I'm like, yeah, Oh my man, dog, feel, my dog died. And oh man. You, I'm going to feel like a jerk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. no man. Oh, so, uh, so that that moment that you you got to smoke with your uncle for the first time like and like what was that like was that like the def, the, the definitive cliche watershed moment with like a, yeah. a, a, a you know a superior adult that you admired and had a relationship with or 
Yeah, I, you know, I think I think when you really when you really break it down, right, the the process and the art of it is its own thing, right? And so I'm I'm very much infatuated with that now. But the fundamental portion of it for me has always been the camaraderie and, and kind of the community. I mean, because you know, it, it's we read it like a book now, but it's true. Like Jr. and I started as consumers. You know, we we spent so much time in cigar lounges because we were both traveling for work and, and meeting new people and you know, when, when my wife and I moved here for, uh, to Virginia, I mean, we joined the local cigar club, just, you know, meet people, you know, start doing those things. You, you travel, you spend time together. And you think about those moments when you're sitting in the lounge or you're doing what we're doing. We're just sitting here bullshitting and smoking cigars. I mean, what's better than that. Right. And so it, it, it just, it gives you that escape, you know, and then obviously we've turned it into so much more, um, for us personally, but even now, you know, I'm still very active in the cigar groups. I, I still talk to a lot, all these folks that knew me before the brand was ever a thing, you know, so the community is great, man. You meet so many, and, and you talk about COVID, right? And you talk about how we became Facebook friends over COVID. I mean, that's universal. I mean, uh, you know, just those, just the Zooms, the late night chats that we've had, I mean, I've probably talked to Pete Johnson more over the last over COVID than I ever have in years. Right. So it's, <laughs> you just end up in these zooms till four in the morning. <laughs> so it's like, uh, it's just great, man. I mean, cause anywhere and it, it is applicable. I've been all over the world and you find a cigar lounge and it's the same shit everywhere. You sit down and you can talk to someone. It doesn't matter about anything else. You're just sitting there having a, sharing a cigar with someone. And that's what's better than that. You know? I completely agree. Um, I think that's the, like we're, I've had this conversation with several people, but it, it, so I recently got one of my coworkers into cigars and he had his first, and unfortunately I wasn't there to witness it, but he had his first experience with a cigar lounge that uh -huh. about, a week, about a week ago. And he's like, he's like, I get it. I get why you would rush yeah. home from work to go work at Michael's and, why it was so important to you. And he's like, I get it now. And I was like, right. He's like, yeah, I had a conversation with this guy who does this and this guy who does this and this gal who does this. And he's like, and they were all like, did, yeah, that's how that's, that's where everyone met, but they knew everybody knew everybody, but yet I was new. And I was like, they were talking to me like we're buds. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's it, man. <laughs> you, you nailed yeah. it. You nailed it. That's exactly it. And, uh, I think that, you know, with, with cigars being the great equalizer and everything, it allows for opportunities, frankly, for, for brands like Stolen Throne to emerge, right? Sure, sure. It's all community driven, man. I mean, everything about us is we, we've been word of mouth, right? It, we're, we're consumer centric. We've it's it's been the people in the communities, in the Facebook groups, on the forums, you know, showing us an exuberant amount of support and going to their brick and mortars and being like, what the hell? Why, like why you guys need to sell the cigar you know it, it, we're still at about i would say 95 percent organic growth right we're, we're we're a vertical company we're vertically integrated we don't have brokers or reps going knocking you know cold calling and all that it's 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 been crazy man it, and it is it's it's community driven you know and we, we take that super seriously you know i i spend i i do my best about I try every day to respond to every single person that sends us a message or reaches out to me. Um, I try to take at least a, an hour or two every day to respond to every message. So it, it's very important to who we are because, you know, before Stolen Throne, we were, we were those people. We were the people in the community, just the consumers, you know? I mean, the whole thing about the crook was the reason the blend became the blend is because if we couldn't sell it, we were smoking 10,000 of them. <laughs> so, so it had to be something, you know, because being a boutique guy, you get bored. You don't want to smoke the same shit over. Even now, I, I don't, I don't just smoke all our stuff. Everyone knows that if you follow, you know, if we're friends yeah, on Facebook or you see me a group, you'll see me post all different kinds of stuff. I smoke everything. And, and to me, that's what it's about, right? It's always about the cigar. It's always about the back of the process and all that kind of stuff like that. But foremost, it's, it's about the consumer because without them, we're not here, right? You know? That's, that's it. 
Yeah, I've heard you talk about that, but I don't want to spoil that for a second because I want to I want to take that into tonight's major point. So, uh, with so as we're kind of already kind of like you're you're perfectly segueing for it, man. It's like you're hosting tonight. I appreciate this. So, so uh, so let's let's uh, let's dive into tonight's major point, which is always brought to you by uh, Barracoa Cigar Company. Speaking of boutiques, right? Barracoa Cigar Company. Okay. Barracoa is back. The Voyage has relaunched. This was a cigar I personally couldn't wait for because it's been over three years now, and with a revamp blend coming out of one of the hottest factories in the industry. Danny Vasquez promises if you liked the original blend, you're going to love the relaunch. So uh, check out sunsigars.com right now. They were the, they were actually the company that launched the uh, voyage for Danny. But uh, check out some check out uh, the, the website today, his Facebook, Instagram, and everything. He's posting new stuff all the time. I'm going to keep you updated on where you can get your voyage next. Stay tuned for more details of uh, where and how you can enjoy the voyage. And remember, never settle. Barracoa Cigar Company. So so Lee, we're, we're talking about the, you know, like the formation of your company and it being very organic and everything like, so talk like, so how many States are you actually, cause you're, you're not international yet, right? You're, you're still in the United States. We are. Oh, we you are. are. Okay. We, yeah. We have a few international accounts. Um, we're mostly in the United States. We're, we're all over. We're, we have about a hundred accounts with a wait list of about another 25. Um, Where so, are the international accounts? So we're in New Zealand, Australia, Oh, wow. Um, okay. We're in China. We're working on European distribution. That's probably coming, uh, if not later 2021, early 2022. All right. So your cigar retails for how much here in the United States typically? <laughs> it sells for how much here in the United States? In the United uh, States. MSRP, we're about 10 50 and 11 bucks on the crook and about 10 10 50 on the call. So that's forty dollars in New Zealand and Australia. Yeah. So like the biggest thing everyone's taking the piss out of me about is the Argos. So we'll talk about that a little later with the charity stuff. But uh, the Argos is going for like eighty dollars a piece right now, and uh, they give me a yeah. They get I get I get picked on a lot for that. It's not my fault. I didn't. Yeah. Do it. I, yeah. You didn't. You didn't. You you didn't levy the taxes, man. Yeah, I, but I'll I'll get tagged in a post. Oh, here's another eighty dollars gone. Someone's smoking an Argo, say. But it is what it is. It's it's absurd, you know. It it's just to think about that, you know, especially because we're so we're so price conscious, you know. Um, but yeah, it's it's wild to see what the the other markets, you know, value cigars at, you know. But it's it's much more, and I, I have to explain this to a lot of folks too. Is like when you a lot of other countries especially Europe and especially the Asian countries like the Middle East and, and all that kind of stuff is it's much more of a status thing than it is like you, it's very different than here where you can go spend 20 30 bucks have a couple of spares with your friends at a lounge and you know it's a day there it's it's very it's it's super different and they're also taxed a lot higher especially New Zealand so the, there's there's a whole different kind of realm of what the market dictates um, but it, yes, uh, that's a good one. You brought that up. That's a good one. <laughs> well, it's it, it, to me, I mean, I always, my comparison is always to Canada because I have my oh, in-laws, yeah. my in-laws live in Vancouver and I, I, I'm still, I, I mentioned this constantly and I know my audience is sick of hearing it, but it just drives me. It just, I, I just, I can't, fa first of all, I can't fathom Australia where it's probably, it's where it, where it is more, not pop probably more but sure. it is more but like you can get an arturo fuente short story in the states here for anywhere from 650 to eight bucks depending on the state right you know california is probably the high end probably maybe closer to nine maybe right yeah. in in canada it's 34 dollars. oh yeah oh yeah it's yeah. just insane to me insane yeah and and in those markets i mean you 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 always hear this like you know why aren't Nicaraguan scars bigger in these markets? Well, I mean, nine times out of 10, if you're a traveler and you have to pay the same, why wouldn't you pay for something you couldn't get, right? So the Cuban mark, I mean, if you're going to get be able to get a Cuban or this, that, regardless of what you feel about Cuban tobacco, that's something different. But, you know, I will say this, especially Europe, we've seen an, a super increase in demand for Nicaraguan tobacco over just over the last two, three years. I mean, we've been inundated with the requests for distribution there and stuff like that, you know. Um, so I do see that the tide is changing, but I understand why it, it is the way it is currently, right? Because like you stated, if you have cigar A and cigar B and they're both the same, 
you're going to go with whatever pomp and circumstance leads you to one or the other, right? So, sure. well, I think you got the unique opportunity with Europe because if you go to Europe right now, and my my partner on Cigar Coup Primetime Special Edition, Will Cooper, has told me this, and he he was traveling uh, with his job for a time. He was traveling to Europe quite a bit for for about 18 months and he would what he was noticing is that in these lounges yes the 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 gentlemen were still smoking cubans and habanos or connecticut shade very milder milder cigars davidoffs things like that but the women the men the women were smoking liga privada foundation wise man maduro like stronger cigars so i i think uh what we're smoking today even though I think the I think the wrapper is kind of a little misgiving. It's not I mean, it is. bold, it is, but yeah. it's not like knock you in the face here. And, and um, honestly, if you want to talk about if you want to talk about nicotine content, it's actually uh, it is actually milder than the call is, right? Uh, and you wouldn't see that. And that's a huge thing with the the wrapper. Everyone seems a darker Maduro is going to be stronger. That's not always the case, and more often than not, it's not the case. Uh, but but you you hit on a soup a, a really big point is that the market segment of female smokers is growing exponentially, mm-hmm. you know, just the, and I love it. I mean, you, you see these women, you know, women, ladies nights at these uh, cigar lounges and you see these like c- clubs that are just for women. I love, it's great. I mean, then you're right They They are, they do love cigars. They, they, they pay attention. They, they do like the bolder stuff. And, and honestly, when, when you're interacting at events, you know, I, I think it, it, it becomes this thing where people don't realize that, they're just as into it as everybody else. It's like, it's, it's one of those misnomers, right? You know? And so it is awesome. And it does drive, uh, it, it drives the advancement of the, the industry and the community for sure. Well, it's not just a smoker. I was, you know, I had uh, Dan Thompson and McAuliffe cigars on last week and I had mm-hmm. uh, Amanda McAuliffe on a few weeks prior to that. And Amanda and I had a really great conversation about this specifically The women in the industry are a lot, you know, women have played a, a massive role in the industry. There's, there's, they're predominantly rollers. They're pre- predominantly sorters. They work. I mean, what they, you know, when we're talking yeah. about manufacturing, it's almost a majority of women are working, but even oh, yeah. on this end, the surface area of what you and I see on a daily basis for the average consumer is we're still seeing an increase in there because the number of the number of female owned or co-owned tobacconists in this country has grown, is grown considerably. And there's some prominent, sure. prominent, like you think about, you know, some of the, yeah, yes, they 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 have like a social media influence and stuff, but like, uh, you know, Angela with Grand Cathedral in, Ta- in Tampa, Karen Berger, uh, yes, she has her you know her her father's legacy and her brand, but she she's a proprietor of of a of a, of a lounge, you know, and right. and so I mean and I mean we could sit here and list hours and hours. Christy, you know, Critchfield and I, her and I had some fun over the Derby this weekend. She she's a co-owner of a shop as well. So, I mean, there's there is a lot of people. Uh, a lot of women in this industry that even on this side of it, the side we do see that is, like I said, is, 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 is growing exponentially and continuing and will, which is something I, I'm, I'm really excited about because. Absolutely. Absolutely. The more inclusive the industry, it's just better. It's better for everybody. Yeah. A stronger community and a stronger industry is good for everybody. So to that point, we're, we've talked a little bit so far and we're going to continue to talk about your success, Lee, but. Let's talk about something from the very beginning. I want to know a question. How many people told you, don't do this? A lot. (laughs) (laughs) I've never been good at taking direction, though. Uh, No, but it it was, you know, it, I think it kind of, to me, it wasn't so much of a kind of push in the wrong direction as it was. It, it, it caused us to kind of look at what we were doing and then were we in it for the right reasons? And once we asked that question, you know, it, it was, it was pretty clear we were, I mean, you have to have a passion for it. You know, we get it all the time. I'm, I'm happy to help. We, we get a ton of people reaching out that are really interested in what we're doing and, and, and want to do it for themselves. Um, and a lot of them don't realize the kind of work it takes to, to, to have a successful brand and especially something that you could be proud of and something you, you, you want people to partake in. You know, it's very easy for you to buy a cigar and put a, a band on it. There's plenty of people that'll take your money to do that. But if, if you really want to build a brand and build a reputation for being a brand that people want to enjoy and want to have in their rotation, it's a ton of work. It's, it's nonstop. It's just like any other business that you're starting up, if not more so. 
you know, because you always have to be on, you always have to, you know, you have to set your standards of service, of quality, uh, of all those things, you know, and so there, there were quite a few people that are friends of mine that are either brand owners or they're involved in, in some extent with, with different brands that were like, don't, don't do this, don't do this, or you, you or you always hear the, um, what was it to, 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 make, to be a millionaire or whatever, you have to start with a million dollars yeah. or start yeah, with two million, million dollars to make yeah, yeah, if you want to make me a millionaire in the cigar business, you need to start with 10. Mm-hmm. So you you can let that deter you if you want, but it's really about what we wanted to do. Now, mind you, it was still a huge risk, of course. You know, JR and I were both successful in other realms. You know, myself, I was just starting a family. You know, I just, I was in the midst of getting my executive MBA, all these things. And what's one more thing? Yeah, let's just start a company, right? Uh, but you know, there's a million reasons not to do something, but if you're, if you're really passionate about it, you know, the old adage on from Baltimore scared money, don't make money. (laughs) So, you know, it's one of those things where for, for JR and I, it was such a passion. We wanted to take a shot and if it didn't work, it didn't work, but it didn't work because we did it our way. And it just, you know, for whatever reason, it wasn't, you know, what the people wanted or no, or no one was interested. I, I never wanted to be in a situation where if it didn't work out, we had someone else to blame other than ourselves. Right. So, but to answer your question, yeah, there was quite a few people to tell you, don't do it. And they weren't being malicious or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. They, they were generally like, don't do it. What, was there anyone out there that really surprised you when they said, don't do this? Like, did anyone catch you off guard? Like you, you, you'd expect it from all these other people or maybe from a lot, but the, was there a one person who like told you don't do this? You're like, damn, like, why'd you say that to me? Like, was it, was there? Yeah, there was one. I'm not going to name him because he is a good friend of mine, but it, 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 it kind of, it diminished the, because he, we were actually at one of his events and he had caught word of what we were working on. And he had said that. And for me, I'm like, you you just said this and now you're going to go out there and you're going to tell people they should buy your cigar, right? Because to me, it was like, uh, what's Mark Cuban always say? Like, don't tell me it's a passion if, if, if part of your business plan is to be bought out, right? So, you know, it's one of those situations. So I think that one was one that hit me like, man, that kind of sucks. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't, you know, people have their own feelings, right? Their own opinions on things. And, you know, our grind might be different than his, but make no mistake, it's, it is a grind, right? Like it, it, and especially to get as deep as, as we are and to, you know, to want to have the foundation and want to have the infrastructure of, you know, a factory that's ours, farms that are ours, you know, crops that are ours, you know, doing every step to be more and more vertically integrated to control the entire process. Uh, it's a lot, it's a ton, it's absolutely. And then you throw COVID on top of that, right? I mean, I'm finally getting back to Nicaragua at the end of this month for the first time. And I don't even, I couldn't even tell you the last time I was there, you know? So it is, it is one of those things where it's like, if you're, if you're not in it, it it's not for you for sure. To me, anyway, if you, if you're really gonna make a go at it, right? If you if you're really gonna sell people that this is a passion of yours, if it's really not, people are no. And the one thing that you know we 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 touched on the consumers, um, you know, with you know the female population of the consumers growing, this, the consumers also getting smarter too, right? So, mm-hmm. and I love that. I love that. So, you know, you're having these differentiations. They're understanding. They're smoking product, and they're realizing a difference in quality. So if you cut corners and you try to sell them on some, it's your passion and it's really not, they're going to see it. They're gonna, and you see it, we've seen it through the industry. You know who's here and who's not, right? And I love that about consumers. Yeah, mm-hmm. especially the consumers that we're after, right? So I, I, I love that because I fully expect the folks that we talked to on a regular basis that have been supporting us from day one, if we ever started cut corners and they noticed, they would call us out on it and they should 100%. You know, that's, you know, like I said before, I don't really talk rapper binder filler on the show, but, you know, like 
there was one thing about that was one of the things I just I love I love a lot of things about him. But Steve Sacco, you know, where he would tell you like the thing about the leaf and what you know what angle it grew at on which farm, <laughs> which hillside, you know, what side of the you know what side of the plantation, like every you know like very very detailed stuff like that, you know. <sighs> 99.9% of the population just does not give two shits about like sure. and that's that's even the learned sure. smokers like wow that's a little too much and I'm just like sitting over here like lapping it up you know like, oh, yeah. oh yeah so what's the I love it why the south side why not the north you know like I'm you yeah. know geeking out on that kind of thing but um I, I think that in, in in general I think you can have that kind of an, that an extreme but I think there's also some there's also plenty to admire and plenty to get excited about even when it's not at that necessarily that 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 yeah x next level yeah and it's it's all about for me to be honest with you the the biggest difference is transparency right like that that's the big thing for me not you know we always get about like people always want the inside scoop right behind the curtain like who do you have beef with do this this and this and I'm not that guy, right? I don't worry about anybody else, but what we're doing. The, the, the big thing that will get me is like you were saying, it, it's the transparency. You don't have to be on this super nerdy journey like I am. Like, that's just my thing, right? Like, mm -hmm. but there's plenty of people who just own a brand. They buy cigars, they market the cigars, they have a palate, they smoke the cigar, they like that cigar, it's produced for them. And that's great. And that's what they are. And they're honest about it. For me, it's those people that, pretend to be the Steve Sockers of the world and they're not right. And like, mm -hmm. there's no need for that. Cause like one of the things, like when we talk about we're consumer centric, you, you owe that to consumer, you owe that honestly to the consumer to a certain extent right? of what, of what they're getting. Right. Because you don't want to miseducate. You don't want to, you know, trick them or bamboozle them or whatever adverb you want to use, you know, well, that's um, his authenticity. That's not yours. And that's not Carlito Fuentes. And that's not, yeah. you know, and so on and sure. so on. Like everybody has their own, their own identity within, you know, within this, 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 this industry, obviously. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, and you're, you're absolutely right. The authenticity is the thing. So stolen throne for us is it's our journey through tobacco. You're going through our journey with, with, you know, with us. So, you know, it, I always say, like, when we're always asked about, like, my brand blending process, honestly, especially when we did the crook, we are so small, you have to go with what's available. It's not like we can go and we can just pick whatever tobacco in the world we really want, you know, and, and so it, it's, you, you, you avoid being myopic and you work with what's available to you. And now it's a little bit different because now we have different relationships with suppliers and, you know, we're, we're, you know, financing our own growth, growth projects and stuff like that. So it is, but you're right. It's, it's everyone's own authenticity. As long as there's that level is that's, that's what I care about, you know? hundred percent. I think that, uh, I, I think that that's important. We're going to continue, you know, going through this, this particular note, but, uh, there are a couple of people in the chat who are interested in little things, uh, not necessarily do with tobacco. So I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to break it up a little bit. What are, what are you, uh, along with the cigar that you're smoking tonight, uh, Lee, what are you drinking? I actually have a vitamin water here. Uh, I had a couple of glasses of bourbon earlier today. Uh, I might switch over to uh, another glass of bourbon, but right now I have a vitamin water. <laughs> Good man, stay hydrated. So um, that's right. I, I had uh, someone ask what I was drinking uh, with the cook and um, so we talked about this a little bit before the show. Uh, for those in the audience who don't aren't aware of this, my my wife is a is a zookeeper, um, and uh, and uh, she works for the Fort Worth Zoo. And the Fort Worth Zoo is uh, in 2020 was voted the number one zoo in 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 the country. And they recently opened their uh, their highly anticipated uh, uh, elephant uh, enclosure newly revamped and everything really cool uh great i mean a lot of a lot of space a lot of areas great you know great for the great for the elephants and uh a huge bathing area because elephants love water that it, it 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 really stimulates them and and just they love it they love playing in it they love being you know it's just a great great environment for them and so the uh the enclosure is called uh, Elephant Springs. And so Martin House Brewery, which is a local brewery here in Fort Worth, uh, Texas, um, they do a lot of weird shit for the most part. But this is, and this kind of falls particularly in this category, but they did a uh, commemorative uh, beer 
to commemorate the opening of Elephant Springs. Um, they've got a great uh, elephant logo. And then there's the Fort Rizzo logo right there. And uh, this is a blueberry saison. Uh, they're actually known for their sour. So I was really excited that I'm not the biggest sour fan. Um, oh, I love them. I love them. But, so I was kind of, I was pleased that it wasn't a full on sour, um, but it's, it's, it's good. The, the, it's not, I mean, you definitely get the blueberry. Um, don't get me wrong, but it's light, you know, it's 5.2. So, I mean, this is a, this is, I'm going to drink this and have no problem. Um, at least putting sentences together, thankfully, but, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's actually pairing really well. Cause that sweetness that we were talking about from the tobacco, but there's that really, there is a nice spiciness, uh, spiciness to the component. It's a really well-balanced cigar so far that I've smoked. Uh, Lee, I'm really enjoying this and I'm enjoying the pairing. Good. That would, this could have been really awkward if not, right? But <laughs> no, but, it's subjective, man, but I really appreciate it for sure. But to that point, that brings up a story I know that of you sitting down and having a cigar with a lot of people that know Jim Robinson. Oh, yeah. Leaf and Bean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leaf by Oscar, Island Jim Cigars. And uh, as the story goes, Lee, I don't want to steal any of your thunder of it, but I, I, as I recall, you were sitting with him. And you were telling him how much you liked your you liked his cigar, and he looked at you. He's like, "Hey, Lee, don't get don't get me wrong. I appreciate it, but I don't care," or something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, so it's it's a it's a funny story. My wife's from Pittsburgh, and yes, she's a Steelers fan. I'm a Ravens fan, so that creates this whole spice to our marriage. Um, but you know, we were we were back visiting uh, my in laws, and you know, we were downtown, and I I try to stop in, and you know, any any chance I can, and. He and I, he had just closed down. We're just sitting there bullshitting, you know, having a couple of Heinekens as he likes to do and eating some wings. And, you know, we're talking about it, you know, the, the marketing and all this stuff. And he was giving me the, the backstory on his whole thing with the leaf. And then it turned into Dollar Jim. And I told him, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed the number two. He looks me dead in the face and goes, Lee, don't take this the wrong way. I really appreciate it. But if you didn't, it's just a fucking cigar. We can still be friends. <laughs> and so uh, uh, that's that's one of my favorite stories but that's exactly how jim is he's also the first person to ever call me a cigar nerd um so uh <laughs> he's he's a he's a very very cool dude so what le what lesson did that teach you well for the to be honest with you just kind of to keep it in perspective right we get so caught up with our own shit you know at the end of the day, they're just cigars, right? And then it's more to that, right? You, you have this commitment to your retailers and your consumers, but at the end of the day, there's so much that you don't control. And uh, it's kind of, it was, it was a nice perspective to kind of keep it, you know, just remember you know, there's a lot more to it than it's, you know, leaves. We're, we're about to get interrupted. I get this all the time too, right? This is perfect. Because I, I was talking to someone else in the industry and they're like, uh, they, they heard Brody barking and they're like, oh, there's the dog that always interrupts your interviews. And it's like right on time. Here he comes right down here. <laughs> um, listen, man, I, I mean, I, I sell I sell all day, every day. And for the past year, I've been working from home. So I'm kids interrupt my calls all the time. And so. Like when my, my customers have the same problem and their kids will come in and they're like, I'm so sorry. I was like, man, it's just, um, it's just white noise at this point. Don't even worry. About That's it. right. <laughs> it's just That's ambiance. Right. Yeah. Remy, if Remy was awake, she'd be on the interview too. She'd, uh, she, but she knows when the, you know, the rabbit air is on the red light, she can't come in here, but she'd be trying for sure. <laughs> So we'll get to we'll get to your your family and extended family here as as the the the, the night progresses here, Lee. But I'm, I want to talk to you a little bit about growing up in Baltimore. You know, like um, you know, you and I were talking about before the show, and you know, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, but my family's from the Northeast, so I kind of have this two homes thing a little bit. Um, but Baltimore is a part of the country that I've always been. I've been fascinated fascinated with because I know it has an identity just like most places in this country. Sure. Um, I know Maryland crabs. I mean, they're awesome. But I mean, other than that, I'm I'm kind of, you know, I'm at a loss, you know, as far as that's concerned. I mean, like, t talk to us a little bit about how you grew up. Like, what what was it like uh, growing up in Baltimore? You know, Baltimore, it, it has this kind of connotation of being like a war zone, right? And it has its issues, sure, right? You know, the wire. You know, everyone's like, "Is that real?" You know, I was like, "Yeah, it is," but it's not everything. 
So, you know, Baltimore is a hard working town, man. I mean, both my parents, you know, worked in the factories, you know, they, you know, it's a huge sports town, huge sports town with the Ravens, the Colts before then, the Orioles, the whole, the whole nine. So my, my growing up and, you know, it was just about, you know, being out on the bay, you know, running crab pots, like we were talking about and just sports. I mean, sports consumed like my childhood, right? Like it, you know, I was, I played football from about five to I was in my twenties, obviously with, with college and stuff. Um, but it was, you know, you, you, you develop that normalcy, just like, you know, a little bit different for you because you had two places, right. Texas and, and the Northeast, but you, you know, you, you get that sense of normalcy and, you know, I didn't really move. I didn't really leave Baltimore um, until I went to college. So from, you know, birth to about 18, 19, I've gone away. It was, totally in Baltimore and then I moved back and then I was home for about a year and then I never went back I was living in Ireland and moved here but Baltimore is a great town man it, it really is you know just hard working people you know it's a uh, great restaurants you know I, I like to see what they're doing with the inner harbor they're investing a ton of money down there to to kind of make it a, a cool place for people to be um yeah I mean there there is the you know it is a tough town right it, it is but you know there's a bunch of tough towns in, in the country for sure so so i feel like you're you're a little bit younger than me i don't want to age you too much or anything like that but i feel like you might be a little bit younger than me i'm 37 um and so I'm 32 I, okay so i was going to ask you were you a ravens fan growing up or did, were you the colts but obviously the colts had been gone for way yeah, a long time col- so the colts were were gone so when the ravens got there I, I was like a Raiders fan because, you know, we always supported Notre Dame. And so Tim Brown and, and all that was a big thing for the family. Um, but when the Ravens got there in 96, we, we were we were full bore from there on out. Um, I, JR and I have season tickets, actually. So we, we, we make it up. Obviously, with COVID, it's, it's jacked us up as, as well as me having a child now. But, yeah, we used to go to every home game. Um, and now we still we we still plan to, to we're looking forward to going back next season, uh, but yeah, you know it's uh we've been diehard since they they came back to the the town in uh, ninety six. Was was it uh, was it uh, you know strange for you to like you know for, to for to root for this team from afar because of a because of an association rather not because of geography or anything like that, but then all of a sudden to be thrust into the this environment of like, Oh, we have a hometown team. I mean, was that, was that strange for you as a kid or what did it, it-, it was, it was strange because, you know, it's like you see the, and, and the success, you know, of the team so quickly kind of changed everything. Right. You know, you don't really get it until you're in a town that, that lives it. Right. And what, what I mean by that is like prime example, you know, Baltimore is only about half hour from DC. Right. But no one cares about hockey. We didn't hear about the Capitals. Like no one, get, no one cared. And it was, it, and it wasn't until I went to you know college outside of Pittsburgh where that's a hockey town, man. Oh, that yeah. is a hockey town. They love their hockey, and and so you get thrust into this culture, and and you start to see it, and it, it just like cigars, it becomes this community where, you know, you live and die by this this this, you know, extensive impact uh, in the community but I, I definitely noticed that when the ravens came to town especially with winning that super bowl in 2000 like youth football locally went through the roof my dad and my grandfather both ran the local youth football league so that, that just it it blew up right once the ravens were here because you're seeing it every day it, you're being exposed to it and, and then you see the success right the ravens win the super bowl in 2000 and all these kids now want to play football all these kids want to be like you know, Ray Lewis and, and, and all those things. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely different, man. And then you, especially like here, right. Hampton roads, it's such a transient area. You'll see all kinds of, cause it's so it's probably 90% military here. You, you see all these fans, there's no real home team. And it's like, it, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's definitely weird, but it's completely different when you're in that town, you have that home, you have that hometown team. Um, and it was cool because you grow up and you hear all these stories like my grandparents, you know, they were season ticket holders for the Colts all the way up until they left in the middle of the night. Right. So you hear all these stories of how, you know, their, their social life and all that kind of stuff revolved around having the sports. And we still have the Orioles, which 
Baltimore, you know, supports their, their sports teams, but it definitely was different for sure. So I bring, you bring up a good question though, because, you know, Washington's right there. Um, but for everything that I've gathered, like there is a, there is a, there is a true identity split. Like, I mean, we're talking a stone's throw, a 45 minute drive. That's because of traffic. They're actually a lot closer. Um, but I mean, you're a, you are, there's, there's a Washington football fan and there is a Ravens fan now and oh, yeah. there's an Orioles fan and you know, the, the, the nationals. nationals. Yep. Um, yep. I mean, it's that, I mean, it's that split. It's, I mean, it's, I mean, there's, I it's, mean, it's night and day. It's night and day, man. It's like, you know, and and you're right. It's, it's really no different. If you look at it geographically, it's very similar to like Fort Worth and Dallas. Right. You know, so sure. it's very similar, but it's polar opposites. You know, I would love to see if we, I, I don't know. I don't know if we'd ever get to that point in any major sport, but I would love to, I would love for there to be a competing major market sport in our in our area like i would love to see like the dallas cowboys and the fort worth whatever or the yeah um you know rangers they claim the entire state texas rangers but like i would love to see like the dallas mavericks and then something else in forward like i think that would be really cool to see that kind of develop um i think you would see it too i think you would see the identity split right you know i mean it's it's just completely different you know when back pre-covid like you know going to a Ravens game in, in downtown Baltimore on, on a, on a Sunday, it's nuts, man. Like parking lots are packed. People are tailgating. Like it's, it's nuts. It's great. It's, it's, it's an awesome, awesome thing to see. And it, it does. You're right. You, you, it's funny when you see these towns and you, you see the cities and the, the teams associated, it's like a, it's an all in one identity, right? It's uh, it's, 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 it's almost, unexplainable but I, I definitely think that you would see the same thing if fort worth ever had something like that that could compete directly with dallas mm. well there is because i mean if you talk to anyone who's from fort worth there's there's fort worth and if you talk to anyone in fort worth they refer because to the rest of the world for most people it's dallas fort worth is what you call it dfw yep if you talk to anyone in fort worth it's fort worth dallas <laughs> <laughs> in fact my favorite barbecue restaurant in fort worth is this place called railhead and I have a t-shirt of theirs and I love their t-shirts and they've had this t same t-shirt slogan for uh, 30 years um, on the back of it says life is too short to live in Dallas. Like <laughs> so they have, they have this, got, they, there is this identity. It's interesting. I gotta, I gotta add that to the list. I've never been there. I, you know, Noel knows when I come to Texas, I have one rule. We can eat whatever you want as long as it's barbecue. So I've hit every, I've, I've hit a, a bunch of them. So I gotta add that to the list. Have you been to 1050? by uh oh yeah by renegade yep. yeah that's, uh, that's actually Heim. Heim. heim's good uh, i've been to heim i've been to 1050 um what are some other ones pecan heart lodge i've been to heart eight uh i've been to heart eight i've been to uh cadillac uh where else did we go Cadillac. i've been good. to a bunch i've been to one yeah cadillac you know I, cadillac made me break my rule man I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to stand in line and wait and wait and wait to eat barbecue. But I sure as hell did. Someone <laughs> told me, someone reached out. They're like, man, you, you got to go to Cadillac. You're doing it all wrong. You know, they saw me at like Terry Black's or something. They're, they're like, you're doing it all wrong. You got to go to Cadillac. And uh, I sure as hell waited online there. Uh, but it was worth it. It was very good. The, uh, it was very um, good. The hidden gem is uh, here in the mid cities. I live in the middle of the Metroplex, um, and there's this uh, place over in Bedford. It's called Rosacos Barbecue and Soul Food. Man, it is a it is a gem. Best pulled pork I've ever had in my life. It's freaking amazing. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. It's outstanding. Outstanding. Um, so, you know, you know, with growing up in like Baltimore, like you talked about some of the good things that you remember and everything, including football, which we'll you'll get into here in a second. But like, like what were some of the challenges that you ran into as a kid or like what was some like the work were like if now that you've now that you've gotten older and you've experienced some other parts of the world including Ireland that's that's really awesome like what, what were some of the the more challenging aspects of of growing up in the city as you is to use your words a minute ago that it gets described as a war zone did you I mean did you experience any of those negative things or um, unfortunately yeah you know um 
the problems there are real, right? Between drugs and, and, and gun violence, for sure. You know, I've lost a, a ton of people that uh, I went to high school with, I played with, you know. Um, you know, I'll never forget, like, the. unfortunately, it's we're taking a really morose dive here, but the, uh, the, the, the day I checked into my freshman camp in college, um, one of the guys I used to play basketball with was, you know, un unfortunately murdered by a 13 year old, you know? So those, those things are, are real, but it, it's not, it, it shouldn't define the city as a whole, but yeah, the, the violence and stuff is a very real thing. It, it is, you know, and unfortunately I've had more than my fair share of seeing the rest in peace posts from people that I grew up with or, or went to high school with and, it, that that is a sad part of it for sure that is i i, I can't imagine Lee, what that was like. yeah uh, yeah it's uh it's not great i but, really wasn't you know, expecting that i'm sorry I was, I'm <laughs> no i mean it is what it is i you asked i had to be honest about yeah. it but yeah i mean on the bigger scale of things you know you i mean you can ask the guys that you know that work with stolen throne like We've we've been there countless times. You know, there's there's a lot more to it than that, but yes, it it is true. I mean, you know, it, it, that kind of stuff does affect more people than you think for sure. But there's more to this, the the city, definitely. To turn a positive on it, though, I mean, <laughs> you, you for for all intents and purposes, like you. you I think anyone who's talked to you for more than five minutes or listened to you for more than five minutes understands how that you're a genuine person. But do you think that sincerity and this drive, the stubbornness that we talked about earlier when people were telling you, no, don't do this. Like, do you think these, these tragic events that you didn't, that you didn't allow to define your childhood sure. life have kind of, you know, lifted you up to this, to this space? Oh, definitely, man. I, I think a hundred percent because, you know, that, that could have easily been me, man. Like I, I'm still a knucklehead. I'm a little bit more of a refined knucklehead, but I'm still a knucklehead. Right. Like, so, you know, the, the fighting and all that kind of stuff in high school, I could have easily went the different way, but that was also, you know, the support system and, and, you know, the family and friends that pushed you to want more out of life. And, and, and you kind of were, smart enough to see what other choices some other folks made and 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 to, to their definition the friends that i did have that made the mistakes were, went out of their way to make sure that the rest of us didn't replicate them right so going getting out of the city going going away to college and establishing a, a different path and, and that kind of stuff 100 percent, man but you know because the the you know, you get that chippiness, but it, like I said, it's a blue collar town. So you're used to the, the cards being stacked against you. Right. Like, you know, I always heard I was too small to play football and, and doing all these things. So it becomes daunting if you allow it to, but it can also be fuel. Right. You know, so, you know, we always joke about the story about the company, you know, getting started in the name and all that, but that's, that's the shit that fires me up. Right. Like I've always been, if you ask anyone that's known me for a length of time, the worst possible thing you could do to, is tell me I can't do something. Right. Because even if I didn't want to do it, I or, damn sure want to do it now. Or is it the best so, thing? Is it the best thing that they can say to you though? It's the best thing for me, <laughs> but because like, I'm just one of those people where even if I didn't want it, then I sure as hell want it now because you just told me that I couldn't do it. Right. Right. So it, it's, it's whatever you will, it's whatever you make of it, dude, just like anything else, right? I don't think that I'm any, any better or worse off because I came from there. I choose to work really hard at the things I choose to put my effort into, you know, the opportunity costs go up. I mean, you're a father, you understand when you, when you throw a, a wife and child into it, the game completely changes, right? 100%. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where if you're going to take your, I always tell people, you know, stolen throne can't fail because it's not so much the money that we invested. It's the time that I'll never get back with my kid because I've been on the road or I've been in Nicaragua sorting tobacco or, you know, doing whatever, you know, so that's the opportunity cost of, of having something like this. Right. So it, it definitely, everything plays a part in, in, but it's also your choices of how you react to those situations. 
I, I, I certainly don't want to sit here and play tit for tat or, or compare your lives in any way, but there is a lot of similarity to some of the unfortunate experiences you grew up in. One of your favorite players of all time, Ed Reed. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and I recall a story where you actually had the, the privilege of, and it was pretty random, meeting him. At, Super at, random. At a Super tailgate, random. right? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I've never been that guy to uh, – get starstruck or you know whatever right so um one of one of our accounts great people i've known i've known pete for such a long time through cigars um spartan cigar lounge they uh elkton maryland they they used to pop up at the ravens tailgates um and so you know we always go so they always ask hey man come hang out you know sling some cigars i mean we don't have anything else to do it's free booze we're sitting there we're going to go into the game anyway so sure let's do it um and you know i had heard a few times after we come like hey you know like ed like he likes your stuff like he, he's you know ed reed's big in the cigars big in the yeah. the, the culture and, and the community had a cigar um, in his mouth when he got inducted into the hall of fame man and that's right that's right so he's like yeah yeah he loves your stuff and i'm like that's great man that's awesome you know and so we're sitting there i'm talking to some folks and uh i get a tap on my shoulder and like, uh, I should have known, but I was talking to someone, we were, you know, we were talking about cigars, I was talking to a consumer and uh, th- I started to hear this rush and this, you know, the, the loud roar and, and all that stuff. And he had a tap on my shoulder and I turned around, it's Ed Reed, right? He's got, he's got a crook in his hand. He's just like, hey man, I love your stuff. Shakes my hand, we talked a little bit and he actually uh, took my phone number. And it's like one of those things, like you get the, you get the phone number of, you know, Ed Reed, you're like, okay, like, yeah he's not he's not gonna text me it, it is what it is it's still a cool story a couple pictures we're good to go well it's like the second quarter and i i get a text from him right he's in the box smoking cigars and i'm he's texting me and i'm like <laughs> man i'm like i'm like man that's pretty fucking cool like here i am so and honestly i still talk to him today it's 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 pretty oh. cool but that is the cigar community man and it's it's funny because you know my grandfather was a huge influence all my life and you know we lost him five years ago um and he was a huge ed reed fan always talking about ed reed always talking about you know very big into football um he was like one of my very first coaches and he was he was one of my grandfather's favorite players so the whole thing kind of came full circle um it it, it was it was definitely a cool moment it was definitely a cool moment he he sent me a hat for the whole you know he did the the er hall of fame hats he sent me a hat um we were supposed to go to Nicaragua, but then COVID hit, you know, so it's, it's been, it's, it's been pretty cool to be able to call him a friend now. So it's, uh, I don't get starstruck, but that's been a pretty freaking cool moment for sure. That's awesome. I, you know, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to meet my, my childhood hero. Um, and you know, they, you know, like we were talking about monikers earlier, like, you know, sayings and stuff. One of the sayings is don't ever meet your hero. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you had a pretty good experience and, uh, and, uh, but I also, you know, I met Frank Thomas, even though I was a Boston Red Sox fan growing up, Frank Thomas was my guy and I got to meet him as a, as a college student. He was in the twilight of his career, obviously at that point, but sure. Um, uh, I was running cable as an intern for ESPN and they were doing the game Rangers. He was with the athletics at the time and, like I said, the twilight of his career. And uh, okay, yeah, so it was, it was late. Yeah. Oh, yeah, late. super late. Uh, Might have been his last season. And he, I think he had one season and a half left uh, between that and the Blue Jays and stuff. And, uh, and I remember walking up to him and I like, I was working technically. And I walked up to him, I said, and I happened to have, I had a, I was, you know, I had a ball in my cargo short and I pulled it out. And I was like, I was like, you know, I was like, Frank, I, you know, it would, it would honor me if you gave me an autograph. He's like, sure, you got a pen. And of course, numb nuts here. I don't have a, fucking pen <laughs> so what do i do i turn around and like i'm like god please someone have a pen and uh it was ken maka was the the manager of the athletics at the time he's like hey kid i got you and i'm like kid i'm like i got a full beard you know in college and stuff he's like but i mean i think he re- he recognized that i was still i i mean i was a child i was back to sure. old you know rooting for him when he was with the white Sox, and and uh and he's like here i got a pen and he grabbed it and you know and signed it and it was it was it was a great it was a great moment and i was talking to him about his he had won it bat that game yeah and i mean it was it was epic it was an epic battle he fouled off like 12 pitches in a row 
uh, it was an entire, it was a, it was a 22 pitch at bat. Wow. You know, and he, you know, what he did was, is he, he allowed, he, he wore out, he wore out the pitcher and, and he got a walk out of it, got on base and they pinch ran for him. So like that was, that was yeah. his bat. That was it. And, uh, and they pinch ran for him and that runner ended up scoring the, the winning run. Um, because, because the next guy up got up and hit a, uh, hit a, uh, you know, a, a, uh, double, an RBI double that knocked that guy in. Frank That's probably crazy, wouldn't man. have gotten around the bases, but this pinch <laughs> runner sure is like that. Isn't that cool though, man? Like it, the, the sport, these like sports are, I don't know, man. I, you know, I, I've been the quote unquote jock my whole life, but it, there's captivating moments, man, that they just, you, you'll, you'll never forget that. Right. You'll no. never forget that. And that's, you know, it's, I never, I've never been able to meet Cal Ripken that, you know, but I feel like I'd be the same situation that I was with you. You know, everyone wanted to be Cal Ripken. You know, if you, if you were a kid in, in Baltimore and you did any, I was terrible at baseball, by the way. Uh, it like, but you know, you wanted to be in your head, you were Cal Ripken, right. Playing shortstop for the Orioles. But it's cool, man. Like those, those things, those moments you'll, you'll never forget, you know, playing days are one thing, but then you meet the, you, you know, these, you idolize these folks and, and you meet them. And, it's, and, and if it's a, I, I don't, don't get me wrong. I have, I've talked to plenty of people where it's gone the opposite way where they met someone that they looked up their entire life and the guy was a complete jerk off, you know? Um, but you know, it, it's, it, it's one of those things like it's, it's kind of cool to have those memories from, from a sport. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, so this was a turn I didn't expect tonight. You got to talk to me about Ireland. What, how did, how did Ireland come up? Like what, what, what took you to Ireland? Ireland is great, man. So I lived in Cork. Uh, and honestly, I always, tell, I always tell everyone, like if I didn't have a family and I was completely by myself, like, you know, you know, my grandparents know nothing. I would have never came back. It was an, awesome experience um so there was like an exchange program uh with uh our colleges you know and so i went over there did a little consulting work while i was also studying too so i got to live there for a year um man it was it was amazing it was amazing it was uh like i said man you know on the positive side all the things that you hear are true everyone's super friendly you know like they there there is no stranger it's super safe. It's just a very, very, very cool place to be. And it was such, so drastically different than anything I've known in my entire life. Here I am. And it's, it's funny because you talk about being a kid and, and being in college. The cool thing about that is, is you don't know what you don't know, right? Sometimes the moment isn't too big for you because you're, you're not smart enough to realize it. So here I am, you know, 19, living in a different country, completely by myself. Uh, but it was like one of the best experiences of my life, for sure. 100%. You know, and he and like just talk about, you know, being in from Baltimore. Here I am, like never in the majority of the people that I grew up with never left our hometown. And here I am living in Ireland. Right. So it's a uh, super cool experience, man. And, and once COVID's over and travel, I can't recommend it enough. It's everything you think it's going to be and more like it's, you know, I, I always tell people I, I got to take my wife back. I took her a couple of years ago for her 30th birthday. Uh, and it, it was just so cool to be back. Um, yeah, but dude, it's definitely, if you've never been, you should definitely go. No, I, I haven't, uh, I haven't had the pleasure yet, but that's, that's something I definitely want to check out. And, um, you know, as cliche as it sounds like, I mean, I, I definitely want to go to some distilleries. I definitely want to check out Guinness. Oh yeah. Um, you have to, it's, it's, it's super touristy, but it's, it's, it's a, it's a fun experience. And, uh, for me, you know, you're talking about nerd and like the business aspect of everything to me the best part about guinness is when you walk in there you know they have the original deed or lease for the the the, the brewery in like this bulletproof thing in the middle arthur guinness was a, was a fucking astounding businessman he locked in like a, a thousand year lease for like pennies on the dollar right that's like awesome. it, it's it that's that's a pretty cool thing so he has it for like eternity in a day for like i don't know like equivalent of like 100 bucks you know <laughs> so like it, it, it that, that was a, a pretty cool thing but the, the tour is, is is a cool thing to do you, you get to do the 
pour your perfect pint. My wife got a huge kick out of that. Um, but if you go get out of Dublin, I, I, I gotta say that because my friends in Ireland will probably eventually see this and they'll break my balls about it. They all gave me a hard time about it. Cause they're like, you took your wife to Ireland and you didn't really even leave Dublin. Right. You know, so <laughs> there's so much more to see. Um, it's a, it's crazy when you think about it on a scale, right? You know, there's way more people where you live than in the entire country of Ireland. So it's about four and a half million people and about two and a half live in Dublin. Yeah. So, and the Irish are actually the most trans, but per capita, they are actually the most transplanted people on the planet. More, oh, yeah. more Irish people live outside of Ireland than actually do in Ireland. Yeah. Um, no. which is which is really cool that their that their culture and and their history is able to kind of span the globe and uh, the way that it has it's 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 a really interesting study of of their people uh because i mean there was that whole the whole irish migration the potato famine and everything like that, that oh yeah was sure. the original drive but even since like even since then even in 2021 they're still they're still leaving in droves and you know, it's not like we're talking about a third world country here. I mean, Ireland is no. a developed nation and, and, but that they, that they're still exporting their heritage. Uh, well, and you know, they're just, a, they're just a different people and, and Europe's like that in, in general, but Ireland, what I noticed is like, especially all my friends that I have there is that, you know, they embrace life to a completely different extent than, than we're used to here. We get so caught up in our shit. And I remember, it's funny because, you know, they love Garth Brooks, right? And so do I, but they're, they're infatuated with Garth Brooks there. And I remember when he was doing the tours and, you know, we had him here in Richmond and in Baltimore. I seen him at both. And my buddy's like, hey, bro, if you give me a ticket, like I'll do a weekend. Like here he is. He's going to fly to, he's going to fly from Ireland over for one weekend, you know, like to just to, to be here. But that's what they do. They they go out of their way just to embrace life. It's, it's awesome. Man. And I, you know, I've always said this, like I, I've been lucky enough to where I've been all over the world. Right. But Ireland is still one of my favorite, favorite places. Like it, it the, like Cork is probably one of my favorite cities in the entire world. So are, um, is that something that you're, you're working towards to get stolen thrown over there? Well, it, it's hard now because, you know, with everything going on that, you know, um, you can't smoke anywhere there, right? So it's it's not as prevalent, you know, the, the bands that they have in London. I mean, they've killed London, which used to be a mecca of cigar smoking, right? If you're not James J. Fox, you really, you know, you can't smoke inside. They've gotten super creative. If you're ever in London, there's this place called the Wellesley. It's a boutique hotel and they have what's called a cigar patio and they're super smart, man. I, I love it. I love, I love the, the squirreliness of it all. So, you know, you're not supposed to smoke inside. So what they've done is they put these gigantic, like 10 foot fake hedges and they're like this far away from a covered roof that's heated and air conditioned out there. So like, <laughs> you know, technically it's not inside, but uh, you know, but eventually, I mean, but they're in, in terms of especially like boutiques that are, you know, and in, in the non-Cuban cigars, you know, they're they're still a good bit behind your Germany's, your Switzerland's, you know, Austria in terms of Nicaraguan tobacco and, and, and those kind of things. So eventually, yeah, that'd be great. But realistically, I don't know what that looks like, the landscape. Mercy. So you come back, you, you know, you actually work towards your executive MBA. You start a family and then stolen thrones becomes a thing. So let's, we tease, I teased it in the intro of the show, Lee. So let's talk about it. So the, <laughs> na the name stolen throne, I'm not going to steal a story from you, my friend. So go ahead. And, and my, my audience who hasn't heard this, this is, this is, this is an entertaining shit here. So I want, I want everyone to pay so, attention. So everything you've heard about me is true. Uh, I, I am genuine, but I can also be a prick when it comes to like bullies and that kind of stuff. Um, and I will always say like, it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to us because one of the hard things like the tobacco selection and, and, and the blend creation, that was the easy part, but naming the brand and like, especially with how we operate and, and what we really care about, we, we didn't want to fake it, right? Like we didn't want to just create this like catchy name that like we had to kind of go out of our way to sell it to you, right? We wanted it to be authentic. 
and we just couldn't do it. We, we, we landed on a name, then it ended up being trademarked. We go through this whole trademark thing and then we're back to scratch, right? So JR and I have been around the industry for about 15 years, you know, just from traveling, meeting people. It's a small world, right? You meet people, mm -hmm. you know people. And, and so we had always talked about it. We had always talked about it. And finally, JR lit the fire under our ass to get this thing going. And, uh, you know, we come up with the cigar, we've, we've had the blend, we're smoking the blend and we just can't name the company, dude. <laughs> like, uh, you know, so, and then, you know, we, we, we had been at the cigar dinner. One of our very first account invited us to this dinner. This before we had cigars, we were just friends with the guy. And there were a couple of people there, some, you know, some higher up, you know, sales folks and a couple of brand owners. And I've been drinking since like noon that day in my defense. <laughs> um, so, and it, if you ever met JR, he's very quiet and, and all this kind of stuff. And this guy is like fucking picking at him. Right. And JR is one of my, even though he's infinitely older than me, but, uh, I'm sure he'll appreciate you saying that he loves it. When I say that <laughs> he doesn't like, he he's one of my closest friends. I mean, he was like the first person I met when we moved here. So I'm a very loyal person. We're a tight knit person. So I, I, I take offense to this. Right. And so the night progresses and, and, you know, and they, this company didn't like the idea of us coming into it, you know, and they made the comment, like, there's no seat at the table. Well, without thinking, I immediately fired off. Well, fuck you. I'll steal one. Right. So that dies off. It's not like immediately we walked right into it. So then here we are in this process of naming the company and we're sitting out back at JR's house, having a cigar. We're like, man, we got to name this shit. Like, we can't even get off the ground. We don't even know what we're called. <laughs> like, and he's like, hey, you know, remember that time you told that dude to go, you know, to shove it up his ass? What about stolen throwing cigars? And it was just like that, man. And then everything else after that rolled right off the tongue. The crook of the crown, call to arms, that stuff was easy after that, after we, but it was immediately something that we could believe in and go right into it. So that's the story. Everyone loves that story. I know it's, it's, it is true, um, <laughs> but it, yeah, it's, uh, that's how it happened. And, and the logo, this is the best part to me. Yeah, it's I was going to say, the, yeah, the logo uh, of the, of, you know, Duncan carrying the throne away. JR was drunk and he drew, he drew that on a napkin, just randomly sketched it out. Right. Just and we still have the napkin somewhere, but yeah, that's how it happened. That's how we came up with the logo. We still have the napkin. It's just like this pencil drawing and he, uh, yeah, he just sketched it out to me. That's, that's a, a better part for me. Like, you know, we, everyone loves the logo. We, we talk about it all the time and it just came from a, one random night of JR and Scotch on his back porch, just sketching on a napkin. <laughs> So let's, yeah, let's, let's talk about this real quick. So I, I've got it pulled up now. You should see it. This is, this is, this is it. This is the logo. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, okay. So who, who did you say is stealing the throne? What, who, who's the image of? It, it, uh, JR has named him Duncan. Duncan. Okay. Yeah. And that goes back to the whole Irish connection. JR and I both are Irish and Italian and Duncan's a, a, an old, a, old warrior from, from, uh, Irish tales. So that's why he named him that. But, uh, yeah, dude, he, he put that together on the old napkin there. Because he looked like a Franciscan I, monk. That's what I was going off of. So it's, Yeah, he does have a little a druid to him. Could be a Franciscan monk, you know. Uh, all things are applicable. It could be whatever you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I wish I had the napkin here to show you. But yeah, it, it is, dude. It's, it's just a napkin with that sketched on it. So, so from the genesis of the story, right? So you... you and I, I uh, you know, you actually tell, you know, you're telling that you tell this person, fuck you, I want to steal one, a seat at the, t at the seat at the table. And then, you know, weeks later, months later, whatever, this sketch on a napkin gets put in front of you. And here, here it is, right? In, in, yep. in, in light. Like, did it take you back to that moment? Like, how did, how did this, like, it, it's, it's come to life, right? This, this moment has come to life for you. Like, what did it, what did it, uh, you know, how did, how did it feel? I was just happy we had a name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I can't reiterate, like, how much time and effort we spent trying to name it. Like, and it, it's one thing to be, you know, 
abstractly creative or you know like spont you know spontaneously creative but when you when you're hard pressed to have to come up with something in the moment like it's an extremely difficult thing especially when your idea is that you know you don't want to have to fake it you don't want it to be something that it's it's labor intensive for you to sell it to somebody else so it, it just was like serendipitous that here we had this story completely unrelated we had the sketch and it just all kind of came together and worked you know and then we, you know, we met up with a, a, a super, super cool uh, artist, Corey Miller out of Houston. He, he actually, I met him at one of our events at Smoke Ring. And he's taken, you know, the, the branding and the graphic design to the next level. He came on for like the call to arms. He did all the call to arms artwork. He's done all of our artwork since then. So Oathtaker, Argos, he's, he did the Three Kingdoms, which will be our next regular production release. Um, and the dude just gets it. He's amazing. He's awesome. Um, super creative dude. So, you, you know, the, the call shirts and, and the logo for the call to arms, he completely did that, took Duncan to a completely new level. Um, so it, it's, it's been surreal, man, for, to be honest. You know, one of the things I always say, and it sounds like a broken record, but it's 100% true. I always believed in what we were doing. If not, we wouldn't do it. But to be here, you know, coming up on two and a half years later, three years later. Um, I, it's, it's unbelievable for sure. For sure. You know, we always, we always told people like, and it's hundred percent true. You know, I had like this, like very like way I was going to do it. You know, I'm this fresh MBA. I'm like, yeah, I, I can do this. And here I am like, okay, if we sell 10, if we sell 20,000 cigars in our first fiscal year, I'll be happy. And that's not a lot. That's not a lot. And then that plan went out the went out the door five days in, right? We sold our first 10,000 cigars within three weeks. We ended up doing 100,000 cigars in our first year with just the crook and two Vitolas. Wow. So like the whole plan thing went right out the window, you know? Um, but the way that it all came together, it was just surreal, dude. So, you know, we talked about the imagery of, of Duncan still in the throne and then obviously the crook of the crown, you've got the crown and then the raven perched on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the raven represents Baltimore where you and JR are both from. JR's Baltimore as well, right? No, JR is actually from Virginia, but JR, honestly, before I even met him, he was also a Ravens fan. And okay. so it, it kind of tied in together with his love for the Ravens, but also me being from Baltimore. It would just, it just perfectly fit you know, it was just kind of one of those things. And, and, and I'm dead serious, man. After we had the logo, after we had the name, the, the brand's names and all that kind of stuff have just fallen right in line, you know, thankfully. <laughs> so I'm a, so I'm a big literary nerd. I'm a big nerd about a lot of things, history, literary as well. And uh, so obviously the Raven, uh, Baltimore is Baltimore Ravens is named after the the poem Edgar Allan Poe, Edgar yeah. Allan Poe right yeah you know who hails from you know your beloved you know the charm city so what um I mean have you guys thought about using any of his other stories like telltale heart I think that that's probably you know heart is overdone in in this industry but like sure the, you know the root the murders in the root you know the rue morgue or the gold bug or the fall of the house of usher or anything like that have you guys you know, talked about I it? Did, that's something to, that's something to think now I'm gonna have to cut your royalty check if I ever do it uh, but, uh, that's a good idea. I, we haven't really thought about it. So that's interesting. I mean, cause I, I mean, that's you know, from a, an outside a perspective, no, that's a good idea. No, yeah, well, thank you. Um, no, from an outside perspective, I think it kind of, it kind of Edgar Allan Poe fits your, you know, kind of fits your, your, your mantra a little bit, you know, a little bit. So he was, he was his own, he was his own person. And yeah. And he was, you know, he was a little morbid, but, um, I was about to say overly morose, or... but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, just like, I look, you know, there's like, well, you're very lighthearted. I mean, I haven't met, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting Jr. but you have this lightheartedness to yourself. Very, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've come to find you as very positive. And like you said, you know, sometimes you can be a prick and thankfully I've never been yeah. on that side of it, but, sure. um, but you know, I can tell you, I can tell you some stories. <laughs> but you and, are. And, and, <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. And, and if you asked around, there's some, there's some stories that are true about me. But it's generally, uh, yeah. I mean, that's true, man. To be honest, like our biggest thing is we stay in our lane and we worry about what we're doing. We try to, you know, 
be a positive member of the community and the industry. You know, like I said, you know, people, I, I oddly get this question a lot, like, why would you help someone else out? And to me, that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Because to, to think that we got here, Bertie agrees, to think that we got here without any help is, a, that's just absurd. There was people that, you know, helped us out and, you know, taught us things. And, you know, and if you could do that for someone else, I'm glad to do it. Right. I'm happy to. Right. You know, but that goes both ways too. So you'll have run-ins with, you know, uh, certain individuals for the majority. I mean, we, we get asked that a lot. Like, you know, everyone has their own opinion of the cigar industry and, and the brand owner side. Um, and I'll be honest, with you, for the most part, we found it to be super well welcoming. The people that I want to be associated with and I respect have been great. Um, and the others, we just don't really worry about it. But my, my, my point with uh, Edgar Allan Poe was he was his own person. He was, he was far from about as far from an apologist as you could find. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and I, I think that, I think that in a word describes you, right. A non-apologist. Oh like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're doing, we're being unapologetically who we are, right. We're not trying to be anyone else. You know, we're, we're just doing our own thing to, I mean, to the definition, you know, um, and I, I, that's a huge connection, dude. I, I'll, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, kind of embarrassed that I didn't make the connection, but that was, that's a super good idea. We'll have to take a look at that. Well, so now I'm going to have to give a, a shout out to Bear if we ever do another Al Edgar Allan Poe reference. There you go. That's awesome, man. So, but you know, to, to, to take it to the next step, when you, when you decided, when you and Jr. got together, we're starting the brand, and you were working with, you know, work, you know talking with working with different manufacturers and everything because you yourself didn't have a factory or anything like that obviously right. but yeah. you know there were obviously limitations but i mean for the most part you could have gone with a no let's just say a number of options right yeah we had plenty of options yeah, yeah. so and you know one of the things i, I like about noel um uh, well I, I like a lot of things about noel but I've, um but one of the things i like about him is that he's 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 very hands-on but that's something yeah. that you and Jr. wanted as well. How? But apparently that was that that worked for you all as a team. But like, was there any was there any butting of the heads? Would be you know at no. all even in the beginning? No, none. And and I, we that's that's a question that we get asked a lot. Like why Noel? Right. Um, obviously, I was a fan of his work when he had Guayacan and Saborde Asli, and you know I know some other folks that he's worked with. And and honestly, at the end of the day the biggest thing was he was willing to let us do what a lot of others wouldn't, you know, we wanted to be as hands-on as possible. I wanted to do tobacco selection. I wanted to do blending completely like, and because for the simple fact is what we talked about earlier. If we failed, I wanted it to be because the choices that we made, not because I didn't want to be able to, you know, if this, unfortunately didn't work out i didn't want to be able to look back and say oh you know noel did this no no it was on us 100 percent on us so what noel's been good at doing is mentoring me and jr and educating us and then letting us do our own thing giving us giving us enough rope to hang ourselves essentially you know um and it, it's one of those things where we'll ask i know you know one of the things but especially at the very beginning you know we get into it and i'll ask him a question and be like this is your shit, man. Do what you want to do. <laughs> you know, he'll let me fail on some stuff and then he'll tell me why it failed. And, you know, he, he, he was very transparent and very open about some mistakes he had made in the past so that we didn't do the same thing. I mean, he's, he's been phenomenal in terms of helping us get to where we are and, and, you know, growing with him and, and the things we're doing with him is, uh, you know, I'm super grateful. Absolutely. I'm super grateful for him. Um, and because you're right. I mean, we, we could have worked with some other folks and we had the opportunity, but it just felt right. We talked and we, we kind of clicked on the same passion for tobacco and everything we wanted to do. And the fact that he was going to allow us to control our own destiny. I mean, that's that was huge. You, you'll be surprised at how many other manufacturers and they don't want you to do that, whether it's cost saving measures or for whatever the case. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been great in that regard. In, in terms of a creative aspect, it's, it's super cool. We bounce stuff off each other for both brands. Um, and, but no, it's never, honestly, we've never really had that butting of heads. 
well, you know, we were talking about San Andreas and, and how it has this 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 rustic appearance for the most part. I mean, there, there certainly are elegant San Andreas rappers out there. And mm -hmm. and you again, you could have uh, for all intents and purposes, you could have had any rapper you wanted, essentially, or, sure. or you know, within yeah. certain limitations. And obviously that played a part in it. Was there a reason why you you know, other than supply, which was a, a was a, you know, is a factor that a lot of cigar nerds don't need, like to talk about. But if you're going to make this a successful business venture, you have to choose something from that's available. Yeah. Um, but was there a reason you decided to go with a little bit more of a rustic look on your your inaugural blend rather than try to make something a little bit more, for lack of a better word, refined? You know, yeah, because I'm because that's not who we are, right? I'm not a refined individual, <laughs> you know. It's <laughs> but it's also I also like that high priming. I like the rich flavors of it. I like the way it ages, the way that we package. We do the package aging too. We don't use cellophane, and it's it, for a lot of those reasons. Like those, it adds a functional aspect to it, but it also delivers on the experience as well. Um, I love that wrapper. That high priming is. It's, it's just so rich and it, it captivates the, the blend that we put together, right? Um, and, you know, and it goes back to like my blending process is I'm not myopic, you know, especially early. Now I could be if I wanted to be because things have changed a little bit for us, thankfully, you know, better relationships and, you know, the supply chains better, you know, we're more purchasing power, all those things, right? But the, the issue is like when to me, it was, I was always afraid of the opportunity cost. If I go in here and say, okay, I'm going to make a Maduro. What am I missing out on? Because I'm so struck, stuck on making a Maduro, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm a Habano guy. Like my favorite rapper is Habano. I love Habano. And we don't have a Habano release yet, right? So it's allowing the tobacco to do the talking, what we have available, what works, what doesn't work, those kind of things. Um, and, you know, and like I told you, just as easy as the crook has come together, the Habano has been a pain in the ass for the last two years. <laughs> um, but it's it's one of those things. Like it's just it's just who we are, right? It's we're not we're not some you know we're not going to try to put lipstick on the pig, right? We're staying true to who we are. We're we're executing high quality cigars in our in our way. You, you know, you've you've used that word a couple of times tonight. And I've heard you use it before, you know, um, myopic, you know, you know, it, is, is it fair to say that being nearsighted is a, is a fear of yours that you want to stay away from, or is it just, yeah. okay. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Because, you know, when, when we, when we describe stolen throne as our journey through tobacco, I don't want to be predictable and I don't want to be. I don't want to shortchange it, right? Like I, I, I want to create the best thing that I have the ability to create. And I think that that where we can always get better, we can always try to do something different. And I think that that's very, they're very much at the heart of what we're doing, you know? Um, and it's just, you don't want to, if I ever didn't have the passion or if I ever didn't give something we were doing hundred percent, we'd be done. That'd be it. We'd, we'd be out. And so I think with that conscious effort to do the best we can with what we have and constantly try to get better and get more and do more and experience, experiment more and kind of utilize those things. Um, that's why our limiteds are set up the way they are. When they're, when they're done, they're done. We're moving on to the next thing, you know, for whatever reason. And a lot of that started with the same issue when you talk about supply, right? We have stuff that I can't, we can't make 100, 200,000 cigars, but we can make two or 3,000. And they'll be kick-ass cigars. And so that that ticks that creative itch because I love to play with tobacco, man. I, that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I spend a shit ton of time with Noel just putting a bunch of stuff together, you know, um, and then seeing what happens over time with them. And so the myopic thing, I just feel like if it gets to that point, we're no longer who we say we are. And then that's a problem, mm -hmm. right? Because the, the hypocrisy really is my biggest fear of it. You know, that's more so than being nearsighted is being a, a hypocrite about everything we're trying to achieve here. So one of the things I, I found um, really interesting about that is the the fact that, you know, you, you and I and I think it was deliberate, but you can correct me if I'm wrong here. But you 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 release Crook with two Vitolas, mm -hmm. the Toro and Robusto, which 
number number one and number two selling sizes in in the American market. Now you get a little nerdy with call to arms. You 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 got a Corona and a Robusto. Yeah. Um, but was that the the Toro and Robusto? Was that as in, was that a business in, in, intent or was it just how sure. the blend? Fin- okay, it was okay. So so like to a certain extent, yes. So the blender's intent was the Toro. The Toro was the thing we put together, and that's just because that's the mold that we had right there at the time when we were making the blend, right? So composition wise, like, you know, leaf composition, leaf weight, the whole thing we did for the Toro. And obviously we adjusted that for the Robusto because it made the most sense at that point. But really the two Vitola thing and the display, the creative way we got with the display boxes was a hundred percent a business decision because here we are, no one knows who we are. We're trying to sell cigars. We're trying to get in your, in your shop as a brick and mortar. And the hardest thing to get is shelf space. So if I can give you a box that sits roughly in the same footprint as two other boxes, you can carry both Vitolas of our cigar in, in a, in a smaller footprint. Right. Right. And so, and then you, then you grow your footprint with the next release. So that's, that's why we did it that way. And it's worked and we love it. We got great feedback from the retailers. Retailers love it. What we're doing with, you know, the display boxes and, and the refills with the bundles. Um, and I like it. And I think, you know, I, I'm a very data driven guy, so I don't really believe in the massive line extensions and all that kind of stuff. That doesn't mean that the people that do that are wrong. It's just for us and what I see in terms of data, it doesn't really play. Um, but it, it's, it's funny that you say that because it, it is market derivative. We've seen it. We watch it. Like, so it's like certain markets we have, they love the Corona. They love it. Like they, for call, especially they just, it, they, it dominates. And you have, I have shops that don't even buy the Corona. They just buy Robustos for the call. And it's just because they, for whatever reason, their shop, they don't do small ring gauges, which breaks Noel's heart, of course, because, you know, he's the king of small, small ring gauge. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it 100% was when we started with the Crook. And then it just became something that I like the way we do it. And I like the execution of it. And it just works for us, you know. And we'll do the same thing with the Three Kingdoms. We'll, we'll switch it up, get a little weirder, a little nerdy, like you say, um, with, with the Vitola choices. Um, but that, that's kind of the, the, the game, man. We're just doing whatever we want to do and, and kind of exposing the, the, the market to it. No, I think that, I think that is a, an incredibly smart decision too. When you're, when you're talking about it, when you are talking to a retailer, like you said, you've, it's been an organic growth for you at some, to this point, but at some point it's not going to be right. At some point you're going right. to have the sales conversation and sure. it, you've, you've set yourself up for success there because of the, 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 we're not taking up a lot of real estate and Oh, by the way, we're delivering to you your two most popular Vitolas. So you're going to move the product. So it, yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense there. Um, the, the I guess the the aspect of I'd that that I'd say is interesting is that you're 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 changing it up sl- slightly with the call right by yep. introducing this 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 next new Vitola in a completely different blend, and it you know it's probably because it, I have you know I haven't had I've had the I, so funny enough funnily enough like I said the, the the crook tonight was my first time smoking the crook but I have actually had the call to arms before I had it in the Rebus, so. Um and uh, but the the fact that you're introducing this new Vitola with the Corona, for, apart from everything else, it it it's it gives it gives the your your partners that 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 taste of the next the next step and everything. Yeah, absolutely. And you know the way we do tradition, the way that we we blend, and this is what I learned from Noel is that you know we blend every, every blend is blended or reblended to meet the Vitola requirements, right? So sure. that it you get the best out of that Vitola. And a lot of people don't do that. So when essentially when you're, you're, you're getting the same profile across the portfolio for, you know, the call is going to be the call in terms of flavor profile, but it's going to be a little different. You're going to get a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that, depending on what Vitola you choose. So they smoke a little bit different. So it creates this different understanding of, you know, same blend, but they actually smoke like different cigars. And that, that's the intent to bring out the best of the tobacco and the best of the Vitola, right? so like especially with the crook right so the crook you smoke the toro so you're going to see a little a lot more sweetness than if you would go to the robusto right you'll still have the same profile it's just going to hit a little bit different different intensities at different platforms and transitions so that's the whole thing that's the kind of 
the creative thing about it. And it, it all comes down to what makes the box, what makes the display box is what I think and, and JR thinks is the best iteration of that blend. So it's not like I'm going to make this a Corona. That's what I decided on. No, we blend it in multiple Vitolas and we decide what we want to utilize, you know, because we get it all the time. Like, is there ever going to be, you know, a Corona crook? Well, maybe, but maybe not. I don't know. And if we did it, it would be, you know, I, I've also, I've always thought about doing something on the anniversary, doing like a different Vitola on the anniversary, doing a run of it. When it's gone, it's gone back to regular schedule programming, you know, keeping the toes, keeping creative and kind of keeping things moving. So you mentioned, and, and the whole reason with you working with Noel is to have that hands-on process. And so you've, you've talked mm -hmm. a number of times tonight about how you will tie different, and that's what you love. That's your element. And so we've talked a lot about your successes. And I think a lot of people in these interviews talk about successes a lot. And that's, that's great. I'm, I certainly want to, certainly want to expose people to your <laughs> success, but I'm kind of, I'm interested to hear like in a failure of yours, like what was, what was a blend of like some tobacco, if you could recall in it, doesn't have to be the worst experience or, or anything that, you know, ultimate in that case, but what was like, a, what was some tobacco that you paired together? You're like, you were just certain it was going to work and it was going to be dynamite. And then it ended up, you're like, you smoked and you're like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, <laughs> yeah, dudes. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's a good question. So it's, it's definitely the Habano. The Habano has been, uh, if we ever, if Noel and I ever came close to a huge argument, it was, it's been over the Obama. I worked on this thing for probably going on two years now, probably. And when we first started, I put something together and I, I told you before that he lets me make mistakes. And then when I realized that I've made the mistake, he tells me why it was a mistake. So I put this cigar together and it's phenomenal as a fresh roll. It's great. Like the flavors, I've never tasted anything like it before. I'm infatuated with it. I'm loving it. I'm like, this is it. This is it. This is a, this is a home run. This is a, this is a kick-ass cigar. Smoked it two days. I smoked a fresh roll, left a, a couple other ones rest for a couple of days, went back, smoked them, complete dog shit. I hated it. It was awful. It tasted like garbage. <laughs> and I go back, I'm like, we got to start all over. And he was like, I was waiting for this text. He was like, because you, you know, you use, you know, too much of a, you know, too much Lajero, too much of the thick tobaccos, the oils are congealing. That's why it's happening. Right. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'll never fucking do that again. But why didn't you tell me? He's like, well, now, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and so the funny, the best story about the Habano I like to tell is like, I'm not kidding when I say it's been through like 30 iterations and you, you could talk to Kevin and Josh and they'll tell you like, cause they, they usually get all the stuff that I no longer want. So we'll have these wheels of stuff that'll never see the light of day. And they're like, this is great. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. It's awful. And uh, so one time we were about halfway through the process. So about a year ago, maybe I call Noel and he literally answers the phone and goes, if you want to talk about the Habano, I can't do that right now. <laughs> he, he's like, I, we, we can't keep talking about this. So yeah, I mean, and, you know, not just blends, but, you know, learning on the fly, the way that the, the industry and the business operates, you know, we learn very quickly, like, and obviously we couldn't do that when we started, but now we can is, if you like a tobacco, and, you know, we deal with brokers, you know, we deal with the suppliers like Oliva Tampa Tobacco and, and, and those folks, they've been great to us. Um, but if you, if, if you like a tobacco, you better buy it. Because, you know, I had this like, great process oh well i'm gonna roll some stuff have a wheel or two smoke it and if i like it yeah i learned really quickly that's not the way to do it because uh, you know we had a, another blend in this uh, ironically it was also habano uh <laughs> i love the wrapper right i, lo I love the varietal we were able to get and i'm like damn this is great i had like 50 of them and i was about halfway through and i caught him i said this is it let's go and he goes Pfft. he just laughs he goes Bro, that's been gone forever. It's too late. Start over. <laughs> oh. So Man. you 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 know it's being flexible and it's learning and and kind of and, and growing that way, right? And and being bigger picture, you know, you have to start thinking ahead of the game and, and kind of making sure you logistically you're you're in the right position to be successful. But there's a lot of failures, man, but you got to fail early and often and kind of move on and, and, and stay flexible and kind of adjust and, and get better. No, absolutely. Well, Lee, I, I really 
really appreciate you sitting down and, and sharing your story about it a little bit. So we're, we're going to take a turn here. And, and this is because like one of my favorite parts of the show has become favorite part for my guests and for my audience as well. And that's our two, uh, what I call our fun segments. And uh, one of them is always our, our one must go. And it's, as always, it's, uh, it's brought to you by United Cigars. Uh, featuring La Giana Havana and distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Garofalo, and the highly acclaimed Atabe and Byron lines. So smoke one today and start living united. Now, uh, Lee, you, you, uh, this is obviously your first appearance on Ellos Fumar Takes. And, uh, you know, for our audience who may be joining us tonight for the first time or listening later on wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, the One Must Go segment is, is really very simple. Um, I present you with three things and you've got to ditch one of them. So... Um, and being from Baltimore, I thought, well, we we're gonna we're gonna take it back to your hometown, and we're gonna take some individuals, some famous individuals that uh, are either Ooh. from Baltimore or are, you know, synonymous with the city. Now, I could have easily gone with Ed Reed here, but he would have been a given to keep. Now, someone else did get mentioned earlier tonight, which I have I imagine may make may make the cut, but I don't know. So I'm gonna give you three individuals, three athletes. Okay. Hail okay. from that. The Charm City is is synonymous with these three individuals, at least in my opinion. Okay, so the first one, okay. many people may not know, but he's an incredibly famous athlete, arguably the most accomplished athlete in the history of sports, arguably. And that is Michael Phelps. Yeah. Who hails from uh, Who hails from a, uh, just outside of Baltimore, but Baltimore, right? That's where he's from. Yep. He went to the University of Michigan, as a lot of people know, but he is a Baltimore kid. And uh, obviously one of the most accomplished, not the, excuse me, the most accomplished Olympian in uh, Olympic history. Uh, the other is Cal Ripken Jr. Born raised in Baltimore. His father is an Oriole and he became an, he became uh, an Oriole and, uh, you know. His brother as well was an Oriole. His, yeah, exactly. Billy Ripken and everything. But so the Ripken family, synonymous with the city, but, uh, but Cal Ripken Jr. And uh, the third, we mentioned uh, the team he played for. Um, but Johnny Unitas, Johnny Unitas, Ooh. the Baltimore Col Colts quarterback, and uh, very, very, very infamous as well, and uh, also synonymous with that city. A lot of people think when they think Colts, they think Indianapolis today, but it was the Baltimore Colts, and and Johnny was Baltimore. Johnny was John. Yes, yeah. You know, and the funny story about Johnny is, you know, when the Colts moved to Indianapolis, the first thing he did was requested that his name be stricken from the record books because he to quote him he never played in indianapolis so uh man that's tough but uh oh shit if i have to pick one it's probably going to be michael phelps only because unitas and and, and Ripken were such a big part of my childhood, right? Obviously, I didn't see Johnny play, but he was at every Ravens game until he passed away. I heard a bunch of stories about him growing up, and, you know, he was a huge part of our community, right? So a lot of those guys, they didn't, I mean, they didn't make any money, right? Back then, a lot of people see the contracts now, they didn't make that kind of money. So yeah. these guys had reg regular jobs. Like Johnny and I just worked at Bethlehem Steel in the offseason, you know? Um so because they were so part of and Cal Ripken, man, I come on, I, I was a kid, I grew up on Cal Ripken. And I don't get me wrong, Michael Phelps, he, he's amazing, probably one of the greatest athletes of all time, great Olympian. But if I had to choose based solely off of the Baltimore tie and all that kind of stuff, he's, he's, he's got to go. And it, I'm going to, I'm going to get so much hate now for that, but <laughs> it's, uh, I, I got to stick with Johnny U and then Cal Ripken. That was a good one, man. That, that's hard. Well, I have a feeling Michael Phelps can, you know, probably won't take it too hard. You know, he's got all those gold medals, you know, at least you could outrun him because he's got all those gold medals around his neck. So <laughs> that is true. I don't know. He's a hell of an athlete. I don't think yeah. I can outrun much of anybody anymore, but uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Well, keep that theme in your head of outrunning because we're going to ask something about your athletic prowess later on here tonight so okay um okay. but um but yeah that but that's that's an interesting that's an interesting take because you know uh, first of all i i, I kind of I, I thought you might go that way because a lot of people don't associate michael phelps they associate him as as an american 
because I mean, yeah. he's represented our country so well in the Olympics, but they also associate him with the University of Michigan. And, and so, you know, he doesn't necessarily get that association, but I mean, he is a Baltimore kid and, and, but I had a feeling you might choose him just because this, it, it, those other two now Cal Ripken drew, uh, grew up Cal grew up in Baltimore you know so yeah. that's different Johnny didn't but he is a Samanis so I didn't know that that he actually was a he was at actually every single Ravens game so he's still yeah oh wow yeah I remember when I remember when he passed away they actually put like you know the 19 on the spot where he would stand on the sidelines yeah oh wow but yeah yeah he he was at every home game that's crazy. Yeah. I, re I remember, so my Baltimore Ravens memory was the inaugural game. And it was the, it was, the, well, I'm a baseball guy. So opening day kick, you know, the, the kickoff, the, open, the first inaugural season of the Baltimore Ravens. Vinny Testaverde is your quarterback, right? Yeah. And they, yeah. the entire game, this was something, I mean, this is 1996. Okay. This isn't, this isn't 2021 with, you know, you know, guys like Lamar Jackson, who obviously have the stamina to do this today, if they went, they and ran that entire game with a no huddle offense. Yeah. That was sick. Yeah. Absolutely sick. I could not believe it. It was unbelievable to watch. Loved it. Cause it was just, and that to this day, I can't, I can't tell you who they played, but I know that defense was exhausted. Yeah. I don't know who they played either. That's a good yeah. question. Good trivia. Anyone out there want to go ahead and say, go for it. But, uh, but yeah. Okay. So, so Cal and Johnny stay, Michael Phelps has got to go. That was our one must go is always brought to you by United Cigars featuring La Giana Havana distributors of Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Garofalo and a highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron line. So smoke once a day and start living United. Lee, thanks for that. I really appreciate it. Now um, I'm going to give you the spotlight here uh, for just a moment. I'm going to go off screen for a second, but I am going to introduce this next talk, next topic. But I want to give you the spotlight here because this is something that you're very passionate about. We've been interrupted a couple times tonight uh, uh, with your your man's best friend Brody. Yep. Um, and I'm a dog lover as well. I lost I lost my girl back in September. Uh, it and sucks, so, man. I'm sorry. I appreciate it. It's, 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 it's still, it's still tough to this day. It's, I know it's been, it's been almost eight months and it's just, it's still, it's, it's still wrong. Yeah. Um, but um, one of those, one of those things that dogs just will always be a part of my life and they are, they truly are man's best friend. Sure. So that's right. So you selected uh, for, and as for, again, for people who aren't familiar with this, I, I ask my guests every week to spotlight, highlight, bring awareness towards a charity or nonprofit of their choice. And uh, when I when I hit you up about this, you were like, uh, you know, the Cane Corso Rescue, and uh, this is a this is a, a small nonprofit focused on a breed of dog that's actually quite rare. Uh, it yeah. It's very infamous. It's an infamous breed. Uh, you think of Roman war dogs um, a little bit, right. um, but that's that's where they that's that's their heritage and their lineage, so to speak. But, you know, actually, they they came pretty close to extinction. And it was in the 1980s that they revived. And and in the um, in the early 2000s, um, you know, there was a there was this was Cane Corso Rescue was formed and then it, it became part of the Cane Corso Association of America, which they later split from. And they're now a, uh, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that uh, does a lot of about awareness and, and things about this particular breed. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Lee. What, what is it about this breed? What is it about this cause that uh, that you uh, that you that you cherish so much? You know, it's it's funny, man. We've I've my family has always been into rescue. Um, you know, from, from when I was young, we did Rottweilers. My mom did, has boxer rescues. Um, and then we, I've always gravitated towards bigger dogs, especially in the rescue world, because unfortunately, usually they're the quickest to be euthanized because of their size, of their, you know, perceived temperament. Um, but the Corsos, uh, they, they're just a wonderful breed. Uh, you know, we have Brody. If you listen to any of my interviews, uh, he's probably interrupted because he always likes to be in here. But at the same time, he likes to know what my wife and my child are doing. So he's constantly in and out. He's actually laying right here finally uh, at my feet here. Um, great breed, man. They're, they're great for the family. Um, very intelligent, smart breed. Uh, what I love about the, the course of rescue is that Liz and her team, they're just phenomenal people. They go above and beyond to 
save these dogs from kill shelters, get these dogs to homes. You know, they, they, they have the standing operating procedure where as long as you'll travel within two hours, they'll get the dog to you. Um, you know, and it, but, and it doesn't just stop when you have the dog with you. Liz is great about answering thousands of messages about questions, myself included. You know, we had Brody, then we had Remy. Brody started acting weird because he wasn't the baby anymore. So she was always there to help, always there to, to lend a helping hand. The shirt I'm wearing now is kind of the stuff that they do. This is one of their fundraisers where, you know, a dog needed surgery. So they sell shirts to, to kind of raise those kind of funds. Um, and we're super honored to, to, to partner with them. And, and this year, actually, we'll be bringing the Argos back for Winston's Humidor. And for those that don't know, um, Winston's Humidor has been a huge supporter of us. I've, I've known Kevin and Roseanne for years before we even had Stolen Throne. Um, and, and they're huge into rescue. Uh, they do boxer rescue. And they always did the Seize the Day project, which was a house blend that they released on their anniversary. And a dollar from every cigar sold went to a local rescue. Well, this year with the, the next release of the Argos, um, that, that charity, the, the, the Corso Rescue is going to receive that same deal. So a dollar from every Argos sold is going to go directly to the, the Kane Corso Rescue. Um, I can't speak enough about Liz and her team. They, they're selfless and they, they go above and beyond to help people out. You know, I've been lucky enough to work with them and, and, and to have Brody. And this is, we're just super happy to be able to do something small to help them out and, and, you know, get them what they need. Cause it all goes for the dogs. You'll see them constantly ask, oh, can someone donate a bed or whatever the case might be. They're, they usually go out of their way to make sure dogs get surgeries or whatever they need. Um, and it, it is just, it's a, it's a cause that's near dear to my heart. You know, both our dogs are rescues. Um, and we fell in love with the Corso breed because of Brody. Um, we, we, we've turned other people on to, to the Corso breed. Um, and it's, they're just a great resource and they're just great people. And we're happy to, to partner up with them. You, you know, we talked about, you know, a little bit before the show, like how this particular breed and, and, and there's other breeds, of course, like pit bulls come to mind, obviously. And, uh, you know, that, and other breeds as well that, 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 that catch the bad rap, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, you know, you've got a young daughter. And, I do. Yep. and, you know, these, you were telling me, these dogs are incredibly loyal and oh, yeah. incredibly oh, sweet. Yeah. Um, they are. They're super instinctual. They take care of their family. I mean, Brody's great. When I'm not home, you know, I'm on the road or whatever. He's very protective. He wa watches over both my wife and my daughter. You know, when Remy's sick, he, he lays outside of her door. He's very, you know, apt at what's going on. Um, they're, they're wonderful dogs. They're absolutely wonderful. Does, uh, does, do you ever catch any of those? Because I've, I've had some experience with this. My dogs have never been like this just because I have, you know, Australian Shepherd mixes. They, they're, you know, they're about the friendliest looking thing on the planet. Um, but, you know, the, um, have you ever gotten the, like when you're at a park or everything, have you ever gotten the side glance from people? Oh, yeah. All the time. All the time. And luckily, you know, Brody, and a lot of it is, you're, you're right, a lot of it is, is derivative of the way they look. You know, they're working dogs, so they're big, you know, they have, you know, uh, you know, these these big, like, noticeable faces, and, you know, they have these features that people associate with aggression, and couldn't be further from the truth, and we're super lucky that Brody is very uh, disarming in that way, you know, he's very friendly, loves people, loves to interact with people, uh, he could put people off because he gets so excited to meet people, like, you know, he'll bark and all that kind of stuff, but he generally just wants to interact. So yeah, you definitely, people worry, but we've had him in dog parks. We, we walk him, you know, we, we socialize him. He, you know, before COVID, I, I want to say, I think Home Depot, you know, is pet friendly and, and so is Lowe's. So we're constantly taking him in and out of there, you know, just kind of exposing folks. My wife's taking him to, you know, my wife is, works at the children's hospital. So she's introduced them, you know, so it's, oh, wow. you know, okay. we're do, doing our part to kind of defeat that stigma you know there's still you know there's still things that you know any rescue owner should be mindful of you, you always want to watch your dog around kids always um 
just because of their size. They don't know how strong they are most of the time. And especially Brody, he thinks he's a lap dog and he's a <laughs> hundred, he's 140 pounds. I was going to say, um, he's probably, he's, I know he's 120 plus probably. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's all those things. That, and, and again, that goes back to the course of rescue. They're great at educating you of what to do, what not to do and, and how to operate. You know, we, we had to introduce Brody. We had Bella who's a train Walker Coonhound rescue. So, you know, managing, you know, getting Brody in here with her, um, all those things. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's just part of being a responsible owner, but also, you know, taking care of such a loving breed, man. They're great dogs. They're absolutely wonderful for sure. No, I think you may have mentioned this, but um, I wanted to pay, I wanted to point out again, your, your shirt, your shirt as well. So, and this is part of the, the, uh, their, this is how they raise money, correct? They have these, mm -hmm. these, these shirts and everything. Can we, yeah, you'll see them. Go ahead. Can you get them on the site or? Yeah. So I don't know if this is, if there's, these are still available, um, but they'll, they'll constantly do things like this is the pride of Italy shirt. Um, where, you, you know, if they have a cause, like there might be a rescue that needs a surgery or they might have to cover some costs to get them from A to B. Um, they'll launch different kinds of shirts, different kind of gift card things, all kinds of, they're super creative with their fundraising. Um, and, 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 you know, just for us too, right? So going into the Argos thing, we're, we're raising money for them too by doing the cigar sales and stuff like that. So they're very creative in trying to like spread the word, but also raise as much money as possible. So, you know, they can take care of these breeds and, and, and get them to homes that, that, that will love them and, and take care of them. So I, I put the link to donate inside the chat, everyone. So, uh, and this will also be in the show notes as well for the show, but if you do feel called a uh, great organization, um, you know, and if, you know, I know a lot of you all out there are dog lovers, just like me and stuff. And this is a, this is a fantastic breed that's been great to Lee's family, great to a lot of families. And, uh, you know, yeah, it, it is a, it is a lesser known breed. It's, and, but at the same time, you know, these are, these are creatures of the world. And these are, these are, yeah. they, these are man's best friend, as we were like, as we were saying earlier, and it's a great opportunity, great organization. Um, and uh, they're actually really close to their goal. They, they've got a goal posted right now. If you go to that, if you go to that link that I posted, they're trying to raise twenty thousand dollars. They're just under that right now. They're trying to raise only twenty thousand dollars. They're only they're less than nine hundred dollars away from hitting their goal. And I think I think this is something of a little bit of a challenge that we could issue tonight. Is like I think we can do this. I think we if we push share this out, share this link out. I think we can get them to twenty thousand pretty easily. Let's let's do it. I, late, it. later tonight, I'm going to be donating, in, donating in your honor, uh, Lee. Um, it's something I that I appreciate that, man. You're very welcome. I'm, I'm really pleased that my wife and I are uh, pledged to do this. When I started this segment on the show, we're donating to every cause that comes across, because uh, these are these are organizations and causes and that 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 uh, that my guests care about. And uh, you know, it's the it's the very it's the very least that we can do um, by helping people out. And we're you know. You know, yeah, I appreciate I, it, man, because these people are, you know, they're volunteers, they have families, they have jobs, and they're still, you know, spending exuberant amounts of their time and, and effort to, to, you know, take care of this, this these dogs that, that need it, man, you know, these neglected, uh, it, it kills me, man, to see, you know, animals mistreated. Um, and so it, it is super important to me. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, I was mispronouncing it earlier, and I apologize. Uh, uh, the, it's the Connie nah, Corso it's okay. Rescue. It's um, okay. No worries. So you can go to ConnieCorsoRescue.org uh, slash donate, uh, and it'll take you there. It's also in the link there. They're less than $900 away from 20000 Later tonight, I'll be donating. Uh, in Lee's honor, uh, we're going to be, we're going to get to 20000 We're going to get them to 20000 I think that's a pretty, pretty easy goal to hit. Um, and uh, what a great organization. Lee, thank, thank you so much for, for bringing it to our attention. And, and uh, oh, man, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Lo love what love what the love what these wonderful animals have brought to your life. It's beautiful. Absolutely. So, um, you know, Lee, as we kind of go go uh, away from this, there's a couple of other pieces of you know what I call industry news that we'd like to go into for the last couple of questions for tonight. And again, I can't thank you enough uh, for your time this evening. But you know, there's you know, 20, 2020 was. 2020 was 2020, right? I mean, that was the expression. I, I last week I retired a, a word that uh, I will no longer be using, 
about the times that we live in. Um, so I'm not going to say it, but, uh, but it was, uh, it was, it was an unbelievable year and, and very challenging. So from, from where you sat, I mean, how, how did, how did stolen throw cigars, uh, stolen throw, thrown cigars, how did it fare? Like how did, how did 2020 go for you all? Uh, it actually, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we're, we're almost embarrassed to say it, right. But we, we did really well, but it, it wasn't, uh, our prime goal changed to helping our retailers, right? You know, we we had a meeting when things started shutting down. Noel and I were actually on the road when things started shutting down. So then we had to rush home and all, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but our focus, you know, immediately changed to what could we do to, to help our, our retail partners, you know, um, because a lot of them had to close. You know, we've had folks that had to close for months. You know, some were lucky, like in Virginia, didn't have to close at all. So it really became, how could we be better partners, right? Was it doing Zoom events? You know, we launched a national event where we did all the work for all of our retail partners, where if you ordered something, if you ordered or bought cigars from anybody that sold our stuff, you know, we handled event packs, we sent stuff out, we, we you know, we, we kind of hit the ground running to just be better, you know, try to help anyone through the, the time. But, you know, people were at home smoking cigars, thankfully, so you know, we, we did really well, but we know that there were some folks that struggled. So we, we tried to focus and do what we could to help them folks, those folks out, you know, it it was trying, it's completely different. It's still completely different, right. You know, getting back out on the road this year has been super weird. You know, I I can't wait to get back to Nicaragua, but even that has become a huge hurdle to, to get everything situated. So just being mindful of, you know, what everybody else is going through. Um, but on a positive note, man, I, I think the one thing that I saw was just a, a, a greater, you know, emphasis on the community. I spent more time on Zooms, talking to consumers, talking to to folks like you, you know, made, meeting new people, meeting friends and, and, and kind of building those relationships because we are in it together, you know, not just in the industry, but collectively as the country, you know, so it, that was a very, very cool aspect of it. If, if you know, to take the silver lining of it is just the amount of time I think, you know, yeah, I, I probably have done, uh, I don't know, it feels like a thousand Zooms at this point. And most of them was just <laughs> just surfing with people, just like right. everyone's home. Like, let's talk, let's smoke cigars and bullshit for a bit. You know, I, I wasn't getting, I mean, I think one of the first ones was like, I think me and Pete were on a zoom with like uh trip and, and all those guys were like, it's like four in the morning, we got on at like seven. We were on to like four in the morning, just bullshitting, you know, just like that. Cause we had nothing else to do. We couldn't go anywhere. Couldn't do anything. So, um, it, it was it was super weird, but I think you know overall, you know we we showed our resiliency. I, I I love the entrepreneurial spirit. You know, a lot of our accounts we constantly checked in, and 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 a lot of them did really well because they got creative, right? They made the best out of a bad situation. Whether it was they started doing you know free delivery within twenty miles, or they you know got more involved with selling online and like interacting with consumers and shipping more, whatever they could to keep the doors open. And, you know, I love that shit, that gritty, that grittiness, man, that resiliency, that's, that's what it's about. Right. And, and being a part of that and being a good partner. Cause you know, we, we heard a bunch of people like, Hey, you know, a lot of people aren't helping us out right now. Is there anything you can do for us? And whatever we could do, hell yeah, we're going to do it. You know? So I think, I think we're all better for it. I think we're all ready to get back to whatever normal is going to look like. Um, but we made the best of it, man, you know, but in terms of a company and, and, and sales numbers, you know, it's, that wasn't the most important thing, you know, of course. No, certainly not. It, I think that's, I think that's kind of one of the driving factors behind the segment that I do is just because I think that it was a year of so much, you know, you know, just so much burden. Um, and, you know, I, I learned a very, very cool lesson a long time ago that if you're going to be blessed and be a blessing and, yeah, you know, you know, it was a unique opportunity for a lot of cigar companies and you're not the only one, you know, that was the whole subject of my guests last week being on, it was, we had them on last year and they were talking about the stuff that they were doing at the time when they thought, you know, we didn't know what was in store for us. We didn't know this was going to be a year. Sure. And, and, you know, that being said, you, you know, you know, cigar companies took that took could have taken these great years 
that they had because they were selling cigars. They didn't have to deal with the burden of expenses, or at least not to the extent that they would normally. Right. And they took those, they took that good fortune and they really passed it on in a lot of ways, in many different yeah. ways, which was really cool. You know, not, you know, they, not everyone approached it the same way or could approach it the same way. So it was, it was, it was really great. And it's one of the things I just love about this industry. Yeah, man. And, you know, we're just trying to do, we're just trying to do our part. I mean, we had to cancel a bunch of events, you know, and for those that couldn't do Zooms, you know, we went out of our way to where as soon as things start to open up a little bit, you know, I was sitting I think I hit four, uh, four or five cities in four or five days to do events and, and make up for the, the missed opportunities, you know? Um, so it's just about playing your part, you know, and, and working in unison with your partners and, and that kind of thing. But uh, I was really happy to see the resiliency and, and, you know, the toughness of the shop owners and, and the folks that, you know, were doing whatever they could to keep their livelihoods going. Right. So I think for we're better for it. I think we're all ready for it to move forward and and get back to whatever normal looks like. But it, it was definitely uh, a trying year, and it was definitely something that no one you, you couldn't possibly expect it, right? But mm -hmm. it is what it is. What it is. So TP is only a few days away, and PCA is about sixty days away. Are are there any plans for Stolen Throne cigars to attend either of those trade shows? Yeah, not this year. I mean, we're we are uh, we're supportive of both those organizations. For us, we you know we wanted to focus on getting everything back to normal. You know, our growth is still astronomically outpacing us. Our, our, our you know our supply right now, so we're trying to grow internally. We have all our infrastructure growing. Um, and we're trying to get logistics back to where it is and getting shipments normally, you know, just like everybody else. And so we, we just felt like it was a, it was a better, uh, it, it was mo a more fair effort for us to put that, uh, into getting back to normal for our, our, our existing accounts and the, the wait list that we have, but it, we definitely, you know, plan to support and, and moving forward. You, you'll probably see us at next year's events and, and the events coming after that. What about Lee Marsh, the individual? Will you be at either of the trade shows? Uh, I'm. There are some talks in the works for some stuff they want to do at the PCA, which I, I may attend and I, I may be there. Um, TB, I'm not going to make it because we've got all these things going on. I'm, I, I, I got to get back to Nicaragua and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there is a good possibility that I'll be at PCA in some capacity. That's great. So I, I think one of the most, one of the, best things that come out of 2020 what for at least for the premium cigar industry which was the fda decision that uh really kind of turned back the clock a little bit not not necessarily opened the door but it certainly opened a window um for a lot sure. of b smaller brands newer brands like stolen throne to kind of hopefully get a little bit more of a foothold into the industry when that decision came down how did you and jr feel about it i mean you had to have been excited yeah, we were excited, but it was business as usual, right? So, uh, you know, my background in legal compliance and, you know, JR's background in logistics and contracts, like, so a lot of people see like the, the two years of success that we've had, but they don't see the almost three years before that, before we even launched of getting our ducks in a row for the legality of whatever way they, you know, whatever the way they decided to fall on it, we had an avenue to go. So we were ready to go. We were actually ready to follow our paperwork. We had that going. And so when, when the definition came and, and you know, the kicking, the kicking of the can down the road came along, of course we were excited, but it was one of those things where we're, we're flexible. We're, we're, we're ready to kind of keep things going. We're not fly by night. So it was still business as usual, but of course the reprieve is nice, right? You know, it's one less thing to worry about right now. So what kind of protections do you have in place? Let's say, again, you know, I'm not trying to be negative Nancy here or anything like that. But again, like you said, kick the can. That's the term I've heard used frequently by a lot of people in the industry. You know, there's there. I mean, there's still going to be regulation coming down the road at some point. You know, I mean, where, where does that put yeah. stolen throne? Well, you know, it's it's one of those situations where you, you, you're prepared. You, you keep your, your finger on the pulse, but you can't prevent it from, you know, stopping you from moving forward right like i'm not one of those people we've talked long enough now you know i'm not one of those people where i'm not going to choose to to not get better and not push and not grow because something might happen 
you know, so it's, it's being prepared for that. And I, I do think something will come, but I, I think it's a lot further down the road than people think, but that could not be the case. You know, you don't know, but you know, you can't, you can't worry about the what ifs, you know, it's day by day situation, especially with this, because it's so fluid. Um, but, you know, it, you know, we, we do have, we, we do have legal resources and, you know, we're, we're prepared to do what we got to do to be here. It's good to hear. It's good to hear. It's, it's one of the things that like, you know, from where I sit, I'm really excited for the window because, you know, it allows for companies that aren't as have, a, you know, a lengthy foothold like you all, or ones that we haven't even thought of, you know, to actually, you know, maybe make a, maybe make a stand and actually gain some ground during a time to where they can actually, you know, they can become a part of this, this industry's future. Cause that's, sure. that's my biggest fear is, you know, that we wake up one day, you know, 10 years from now and some of these great cigars, these great people that we've had these relationships with, these great cigars that we've smoked and it's all for naught. You can't have them anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that, that is always the other side of the coin, right? But I think too, I think, I think it also pushes, it, it puts that passion to the test, right? Like I think the people that are supposed to be here will be here because they'll be resilient. They'll figure it out. They'll, they'll push forward. And I think for other people, it'll be a litmus test. It'll be, is this something I really want to do? Do I want to have to do deal with this? Do I, you know, and all those things, you know? So I think it's going to be, you know, a, a good tell for the industry, but I agree, you know, having, having the reprieve, however long or short it may be, um, hopefully it, it kind of gives us a jolt and, as an industry and a community, we can continue to, to build from it. But, you know, I, I'm not concerned that we're not going to be here, you know, come tomorrow or the day after. But I think, you know, like I said, I think it'll be a good litmus test for some of those that maybe they'll reevaluate when whatever comes, comes, you know. No, certainly. Well, Lee, I, um, I just have one last question for you. And uh, but before we get to it, I, I, I always take this time, you know, each week to to really thank my guests, you know. Um, COVID or not, Sunday is family time. And sure. uh, I recognize that. And you've got a, you know, a wonderful young family that you would, you know, I'm certainly, I'm certain would want to be spending more time with them rather than sitting across a, a, a Zoom screen with me. But you no, know, and no insults taken over here at all. I, you know, family is, family is one of those cherished, one of those cherished things and everything. But uh, for you to take time to sit down with me, talk a little bit about your story and who you are and where you're going as a company and as a person, it, it really means the world to me. So I, I, I really want to thank you. Thank you so much. Oh man, it's my pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for your time. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. So that leaves us just one last question, which of course is our curveball question. And it's our Dunbarton tobacco and trust curveball segment, which uh, is always bought, brought to you by Dunbarton tobacco and trust fastballs or curveballs. doesn't matter since the company's inception, Steve sock has been knocking it out of the park six consecutive years in the consensus top three. Yeah, I looked it up and I even got fact-checked by somebody. It's six, six, consen uh, con six consecutive years. So to that point, here's our curveball segment here. I decided to take your background, Lee, you're a football player. You played football, yep. gridiron, grit, a member of the gridiron gang, as they say. So, and you played defense in yep. linebacker, safety, cornerback, a lot of hitting. A ton. So as this is actually a two-part question. So if I could give you, if I could give you the pass right now, you get, you get a free shot at him right now in the NFL, who would you tackle? Oh man. It would definitely be Tom Brady or Ben Roethlisberger. One of those two. <laughs> definitely one of those. Now, so who do you think would be tougher to bring down? Ben's a little bit of a, Ben's a big boy, man. That's yeah. a big boy, but I decided they're not very mobile. Body. So you, you could chase them down probably pretty easy, but it's, Oh, I could definitely catch them. I yeah. could definitely catch them, but I think uh, Ben would probably be the tougher to bring down. He's, he's a, a big, big guy. guy. Yeah, he's, a he's, big a, guy. he's a big boy. Um, this isn't the second part of the question. Would you, would you say, would you showboat? Would you say anything to him when you got him on the ground? Oh, I would definitely talk shit. For sure. Yeah. I would <laughs> You wouldn't sure. give me the sack, Ben, but fuck you. I stole one. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. 
All right, so a little more personal now. You've, you've built up some fine relationships in this industry. And I don't know animosity here. This isn't like who you've got a beef with or anything like that. I'm not trying to bring any of that to the surface. None of that. In the cigar industry, who would you tackle? Oh, man. You got a free, you got a free pass. Uh, who would I tackle? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, You're like you, Bear, for asking this dumbass question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Juan can't sell because he would make a joke out of it and it would be funny. Right, because he's a funny dude. He's, he's a great dude, cool guy. Probably because I just think that would be hilarious. Yeah, def definitely, definitely not I, as big as he used to be. So it'd be easier to take him down now, I think. But but maybe not, because he would probably take his shirt off to prevent me from tackling him. <laughs> I, I I'd actually love to see that. I'd love to see how that. I would see love to play it out. So again, same question though. I mean, would you talk shit when you knock him down? Yeah, yeah, I would. But <laughs> but I feel like he would, he's so disarming that I think it would just be end up being a fucking joke. Right? So yeah. like I, it wouldn't go over very very well. Probably but, be laugh. He'd probably be laughing. All right, let's yeah. go have a drink. <laughs> you, right. got, you got your lick in. <laughs> that's that's right. That's right. That's awesome. Well, Lee, again, I can't thank you enough for sitting down with me for uh, more than a couple hours tonight and uh, telling us a little bit about your story, a little bit about you, and, and learning a little bit about uh, the man, behind, you know, one of the men behind Stolen Throne Cigars. And uh, really, uh, really anxious to see what your future holds. And uh, really enjoyed the cigars tonight. Really enjoyed smoking with you, talking with you, drinking with you. Uh, and uh, it's just been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Ah, man, the pleasure's all mine. Thanks so much, man. So to so our audience who hung in there, we really appreciate you. We appreciate all those likes, shares, and comments. Continue to do so. You can always check out the LOS Fumar page for our calendar of upcoming guests. Uh, next week, we've got Antoine Reed. Antoine will be sitting down with us. Uh, and so it'll be media and media talking. So it'll be good. It'll be a good conversation. One's a writer. I'm a talker. Uh, but Antoine's got some good stories and a great story and a great background. I'm really excited to sit down and chat with him. So you definitely don't want to miss Take 167 next week. If you are checking us out on Facebook, our Facebook page is El Oso Fumar. Don't forget to hit the like button and you can see a calendar of upcoming guests. You can also check us out on YouTube as well. Same page, El Oso Fumar. But if you are listening to podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Podbean, or wherever you listen to podcasts, don't forget to download, subscribe, and review. And if you are a subscriber, I please, I implore you to unsubscribe, but don't forget to resubscribe because that really helps my numbers. And I can uh, <laughs> continue to bring on some good guests and some fantastic individuals like my guest tonight, Lee Marsh of Stolen Throne Cigars. As always, I'm Bear Duplissy, live from the Alec Bradley Lone Star Studios of Euless, Texas. This is take 166. Guess what, everybody? We'll see you next time. <laughs>